Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Stacy Alley, and I am the president of the Musical Theater Educators Alliance, or MTEA, and head of musical theater at the University of Alabama. I am happy that you've decided to join us in this important discussion about how we as educators can responsibly and effectively teach our craft during and in response to COVID-19. I would like to welcome both members and non-members alike, and for those of you who don't know much about MTEA, we are an international organization founded in 1999 and as a means for professional teachers and artists to come together and exchange ideas, methodologies, and solutions to common challenges in the academic setting of universities and conservatories. We acknowledge, however, that COVID-19 isn't the only challenge and crisis currently threatening our nation and our world in general. So before we get started um, officially with this webinar, I'd like to introduce you to our Chief Diversity Officer, Tim Espinoza from Fullerton College. He's going to fill you in on the active steps that we are taking towards um, addressing the inequities that currently exist in our industry, as well as information about new a new committee, which will be um, dedicated to the promotion of greater representation, equity, and inclusion. Tim? Thank you, Stacy, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, we must start this webinar, which addresses a modern plague, with an apology for failing to recognize that leadership in this organization fell prey to another. In the zeal to hurriedly assemble this event, the board exposed their innate privilege and biases by failing to create an inclusive panel of speakers and moderators. There is no excuse for this. When this was brought to the board's attention, we had some choices. We could work quickly to make the event more inclusive and continue, or cancel it and remake it from the ground up. Together, the board has decided upon a third answer. The MTEA leadership feels that the effects of COVID-19 are so significant in our teaching environments that we cannot wait to address these important solutions. But our own failure of organizational leadership and the urgency of our current social moment demand equal attention. At this moment, the board is committing themselves to initiating the following actions in order to begin to address the inequities that exist in our organization and our industry. One, an upcoming webinar to address the inequities that exist in both theater education and the professional arena to be held in July. Two, the establishment of a formal scholarship fund in the name of George Floyd or a significant black artist slash educator such as Josephine Baker, Paul Robeson, or Lena Horne. And three, the creation of a standing committee on representation, equity, and inclusion to help MTA expand its reach, understanding, and their service to the entire theater community. As the newly appointed officer of MTA's Committee on Representation, Equity, and Inclusion, I am sending out a call to all members who are interested in participating in this committee to give, in order to give further voice to those who have felt underrepresented in theater education for far too long. To get, together, we will address systematic inequalities that our colleagues and students face in the academic and the professional arena. Together, we will create and implement immediate actions that can be taken to further our voice and our cause. A formal MTA newsletter will, be sent, newsletter will be sent out in the coming days to all members that will detail how you can become a member of this committee. For those of you who are not yet members of MTA, but are interested in participating in this committee, please go to www.musicaltheatereducators.org forward slash membership to find out more information on how you can become a member of MTA. We will also be posting more information about this important committee on our homepage shortly. We look forward to starting the necessary work to address these systematic inequalities that have plagued the industry for too long. Among the hardest things to do is admit one's failures and to ask for forgiveness, but that's what we are doing now. With that said, we are going to convene this evening's conference with the awareness of the limitations of the perspectives we're offering. Thank you very much, and I'm going to hand it back to Stacy and enjoy the rest of this webinar. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, thank you for um, leading such an important um, discussion. And um, I look forward to the growth that we will be seeing in the uh, very, very soon. Um, now a little bit more about our webinar tonight. Uh, it will be divided into three 50, let me put on my glasses. It will be divided into three 50 minute sections. The first will specifically address health concerns the second, performance solutions and opportunities um, to our production needs. 
And the third hour will be dedicated to discussing how various technologies and platforms outside of Zoom can assist in training and performance environments. While we have assembled some wonderful panelists from across the country to speak on these various topics, please keep in mind that this webinar, this webinar is not going to solve all of our problems. It is not going to provide all answers. Instead, since we represent various countries, states, and educational institutions, we will be asking questions and trying to find multiple solutions to many types of scenarios. We also suspect that tonight will spawn the desire for future conversations on how to handle COVID-19 within specific areas of our, our field, and our subcommittees are prepared to accommodate this as needed. All resources will be emailed to all of you who have registered for this webinar, and members of MTA can also find these materials under our resources page on our website. All attendees are in listen and view only mode due to the large size of attendees on this webinar, which is great. I'm so glad so many of you are here. And if you have any questions for our panelists during the presentation, please use the Q&A function. This webinar is also being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. And all you have to do is to watch it and share it is to subscribe to that channel. So now I'll shut up. And um, now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleagues, Matt Edwards from Shenandoah Conservatory and Andre Garner from Ball State University, who are our moderators for our panel on health and safety. Again, thank you all and welcome. Matt. Yes, I think unfortunately Andre's sound is back out on us again here. <clears throat> we have you back. Hi, am I back? Am I yes, back? You're back. You're back. Not a lot of technology. <laughs> hey, modern technology. Here we go. We're starting <laughs> off with a mute. Anyway, um, yes, uh, thank you, Stacy. And, and uh, I want to get started with asking a question uh, to, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I want to introduce everyone and think about the ideas of the different concerns that we have related to COVID-19 with regard to singing, acting, and dancing. Yeah. So tonight our guests are Dr. Michael Sag and Dr. Wendy LeBourne. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about uh, Director of the Department of Medicine for the 30 Year, or more mission to provide compassionate and comprehensive health care linked to cutting edge research for persons living with HIV infection. Since then, the clinic has provided comprehensive core medical and social services as well as dental and mental health services to its patients. Dr. Sag has published more than four articles in peer reviewed journals, including the first description of the quasi species nature of HIV, first use of viral load in clinical practice, the first description of the rapid dynamics of viral replication. First guidelines for the use of viral load in practice, the first proof of concept of fusion inhibition as a therapeutic option, and director of viral drugs currently on the market. Dr. Sag currently serves on the International AIDS Society USA Board of Directors, is president elect of the HIV Medical Association, as a member of the HHS Guidelines Panel on Anti Retroviral Therapy, and on numerous state, local, and national committees. He was elected into the American Society of Clinical Investigation in 1997. Among his other awards, Dr. Sag has received the Myrtle Wreath Award from Hadassah, was listed as one of the top 10 cited HIV researchers by the Science Journal, and has been listed as one of the best doctors in America since 1994. Dr. Wendy LeBourne is a sought after voice pathologist, speaker, author, and masterclass clinician regarding vocal wellness and vocal athletes. Dr. LeBorn actively presents nationally and internationally on the professional voice with over 100 presentations on vocal wellness and vocal athletes. Her 20 year career as a voice pathologist and singing voice specialist includes serving as the clinical director of two successful private practice voice centers, Pro Voice Center in Cincinnati and the Bibavar Dayton and Dayton, both evaluating and treating patients with vocal injury. Dr. Le Born holds the Conservatory of Music as a voice consultant caring for the voices of the actors and singers at CCM as well as teaching undergraduate vocal pedagogy and a new doctor level commercial voice pedagogy course. She also happens to be a member of the CCM Vocal Pedagogy Institute at Shenandoah Conservatory where she received her Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Musical Theater. 
So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thanks. thanks. Um, so let me, let me get started uh, with a question for Dr. Sag. Now, can you give us a general overview of where we stand with COVID-19? Sure. Um, the, so, <laughs> I can do that. I would love that. Um, so back to the business at hand. Um, I think it might be helpful to go through the basics of what we know about the virus, and I think that'll set the stage for the rest of the discussion for the webinar. So this is a coronavirus. You can see it behind me here. Corona basically means a crown with spikes, and that's what the outer envelope looks like. Um, the virus is one of a family of coronaviruses, most of which live in the animal community. And so rarely will there be coronaviruses in the human population. There may be up to 10 that infect humans. You would know them most as the common cold. Several common cold viruses are coronaviruses. Um, there have been three epidemics uh, with coronavirus. The first was the original SARS in 2003. It was started off in China, went to some parts of the world, but just burned itself out. The second one was MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And that was in around 2012, started in the Middle East, um, went a little bit outside of the Middle East, but also burned itself out. You see little spikes of it here and there, but the, for the most part, it's, it never developed into a true global pandemic. Both of those viruses were estimated to originate in bats and then transition as what we call a zoonosis from animal to the kingdom to the humans um, some as part of its transition, probably through a mutation. The one that we're focused on now is the real bear. Um, this coronavirus is now officially called SARS-CoV-2, and the disease that that causes is called COVID-19. They're a little bit different. The one's a virus, one's a disease, but it's still havoc. Um, this one started uh, probably out of Wuhan, China, uh, originally uh, uh, estimated animals or bats that might have been in the open market there in Wuhan and became infectious for humans. When the virus enters the human uh, into a host, um, the, those spikes that you can see interact with receptors in the respiratory tract. Mm -hmm. And these receptors are called ACE2, otherwise known as angiotensin converting enzyme 2. But the key thing is they're lining our entire respiratory tract from our nose through our mesopharynx <laughs> into the lung. The key reason that that's important is that's the port of entry. It's also the port of an original replication of the virus. So once someone becomes infected with the virus and that replication starts, even before symptoms develop, that respiratory virus is replicating in very high numbers, probably in the billions per day. And every time we breathe, we're sending that virus out into the world around. Think of it as a gradation of risk. Breathing is, say, at one. Talking might take it to two times risk, uh, yelling, cheering, maybe five, singing, and maybe seven to 10. So we're talking about a much higher rate of transmission for people in uh, the theater arts because uh, you have to project and you have to sing and there's a cloud that comes out with you if you happen to be infect this virus. Right now, it's not known exactly what mode of transmission is the most efficient. My opinion, um, and, and I'd like to hear from Dr. Born on this, is, is that it's mostly the respiratory tract. The data that I'll share with you right now um, sort of confirms that. Uh, the other possibility uh, is that it it's, comes out in droplets, lands on a surface, someone touches the surface, touches their face, and they can become infected. I think, my opinion, that's less than 10% of the actual transmissions we can quibble. I think the majority of transmission is through the air. So the image I'd like you to think of um, when you think about this, those old enough with gray hair, you might remember the Peanuts cartoon. Um, there was a character called Pigpen. 
and Pigpen had a cloud around him all the time, right? That's what it's like when you're around someone who's infected, infected with coronavirus. When they're breathing, talking, singing, that cloud is there. If you come through that space and breathe it in, you're at risk for infection. What increases the risk further is if the density of people are in an environment close to one another, especially if it's indoors and with less ventilation. So a small room, say a choir practice, a, a, a singing practice, in a small room, people packed together, someone's infected. Again, the peak transmission occurs in a 24-hour period prior to onset of symptoms. Somebody feels fine, yet they're expressing virus. That's the challenge. And so, sure, after they're sick, they still are um, transmitting virus or putting it into the environment. But the real risk for us, we can screen for symptoms, but it's that day or two symptoms that's the real threat here. Now I'm going to give you the example. In uh, early March of this year, in Washington State, you've probably heard about this, there was a choir practice. 76 people on two different events were together. Um, there was one person there who was viewed as a super spreader in that environment. And up to 52 or so people became infected from a two and a half hour choir practice in a relatively small room indoors. And of those 52 people, um, out of 78 potential exposures or 61 at that one practice on March 10th or so, uh, 52 people or so became infected, two people died. Now these were older people, so the young folks that you're working with, they're equal risk of infection, but their likelihood or probability of becoming sick and dying from this infection are, are much less than older people. That said, young people do get really sick and some young people do die from this infection, just less likely to get critically ill and die than say a 60 year old, like 64 year old like me. So I think I'll stop there. That, that's the major points I wanted to touch on. I'm happy to answer other questions, but I wanted to lay the groundwork of why this is such a critical concept um, and, and for, for people in your profession, especially leading young people uh, in terms of musical theater. Yeah, it's a lot to think about, a lot to process. Um, Dr. LeBorn, can you <clears throat> talk a little about, about those implications for us as, uh, you know, voice teachers or acting voice teachers or people who are in close space to, uh, you know, someone who may be asymptomatic or, you know, have be carrying this in some other way. Yeah. And so, A, thank you, Dr. Sag, for being here, because I think your perspective is so needed. And I love your COVID behind you. I really, <laughs> I love that, I have to say. Um, so I, uh, there's a lot of information out there and I think what's really challenging and we had a brief email interaction about this is um, typically when research is published it's a fairly long process and it's fairly well vetted but there is so much information that is getting put out there right now um, that we're often getting articles published without maybe all the vetting that we typically need. And as performers, there's nothing more that we want than to be out performing again and to singing together again and all of these things. Um, I actually saw one of my very first post-COVID patients today for a scope um, to see what their vocal folds looked like. And so, the reality is we don't know what things look like. These are young, healthy people. Um, you know, one of my artists uh, that I have was in the cast of Moulin Rouge and about 75% of that cast got it. Um, you have some that ended up on vets. Now, as a result, um, there are lots of articles, just what Dr. Sag was talking about. This is actually, the choir practice article that just came out in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, uh, the report on the singers that got this. And I will have for Matt Edwards a resource list of just some of the more recent ones from when I say recent, I'm talking May 15th to June 1st, and some of the seminal articles. As far as singing together as a group, um, 
and Dr. Sag alluded to this, there are droplet particles, and those typically are produced in the upper airway. So if you think of sneezing, those are kind of big mucus droplets. They're gonna fall to the ground faster. When you get singing or deep coughing, those are produced in the lower respiratory tract, and those are typically smaller particles. So that's where that COVID cloud sort of forms. So one of the things we need to look at is how many people are in a room together? Um, are we dancing? Are we singing? Are we singing and dancing at the same time? Um, are we touching the piano? Um, is there air circulating in the room? What's the temperature in the room? What's the humidity in the room? So those, those factors play a role in how fast that, that those particles will either fall to the ground, which are easily wiped up, or how much they will be ventilated out and moved through the system, um, the ventilation system of rooms. Um, there's probably more that we don't know than what we do. Um, and I don't know if you guys are gonna talk about masks, but I actually have a couple of masks that I have here just to, people have asked if that's gonna be helpful or not helpful, but certainly hopefully most of us are mask wearing right now in most of the things that we're doing in public. Thank you. So <laughs> I yeah. do have, we have one question that came in here from Caitlin that I think applies to this, especially since you just talked about seeing your first um, patient who was post COVID. Um, the Caitlin Hopkins, she said, although younger people are less likely to get sick and die, she wonders about the long term damage to singers and dancers lungs if they get sick, even if they don't die. Um, I think that the jury is still out on that. We're not far enough out. So when you look at when you look at studying a population, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but when you look at this, you've got to have some fairly large numbers. I can tell you anecdotally what I've seen, because I probably have 20 to 30 performers that I personally know related to, that, ha that have had COVID, that are professional performers that have recovered. The biggest things that I'm seeing two to three months out, because remember that's all the farther we are right now, is still some shortness of breath. Um, in really fit people, <laughs> that they are not up to their physical stamina that they're used to. Um, we are seeing increased vocal fatigue that I'm not always sure is related to necessarily something going on at the vocal fold level, that it may be more systemic, like breath and sound and resonance isn't quite re-coordinated yet after being so sick. Um, so I don't know that we know the long-term effects, not just to respiratory system, but we also have to think liver and heart because um, we are seeing, and circulation issues are some of the things that we are seeing at least come up in the literature. And maybe Dr. Sag can speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, I think you nailed it. The, the long-term effects aren't known. Why? Because this sucker's only been around for four or five months. What's amazing to me is despite the fact this has only been around four or five months, how much we actually do know about it. That said, we don't know the answer to those questions. Um, I, I'm very confident that people that are, are seriously ill and require hospitalization, especially ventilation, who recover, their lung function uh, doesn't return to normal anytime soon and may not ever return to normal. Um, the thing we do know about the pathogenesis of this virus, in other words, how it causes disease, once it invades the respiratory tract, it spreads into the vascular system and it uses, the, it uses all the blood vessels like a superhighway and it spreads everywhere and it sets up shop in different locations. Uh, as Wendy was just saying, it, it's in the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the brain, the, the skin. And that's where battles ensue between the virus and the immune system. It's in fact the reaction of the immune system to the virus that causes the symptoms. And that's true for most every disease when you really get right down to it. It's, it's the what we call cytokines or the chemicals produced by the immune system that make us have fever or chills or body aches. All that nonsense, all that horror that we go through when we're sick, that's really our body's immune system reacting to some invading pathogen or in some cases a malignancy. So 
when that when that battlefield is happening, sometimes there's collateral damage in that tissue that ultimately leads to scarring. And in the case of the lungs, lung scarring uh, is is the thing that will ultimately restrict respiratory function. Uh, what that does in a young person, I don't know. And yeah. I'm not sure we will know for at least a year, perhaps. Yeah, and if I can jump in here for just a second, um, one of the things, because people go, oh my gosh, my lung function will never return to normal. What am I gonna do? Well, we have singers all the time that sing eight shows a week with asthma. We have singers that perform at really high levels without perfect respiratory systems. And we know that normally as we age, we lose um, some of that respiratory ability. In fact, the ability to get full excursion of the rib cage happens as early as sometimes in your mid to late thirties where you don't get as much excursion as you do when you're in your twenties. But that does not negate the fact that you can sing very, very well. So I don't want people to come away from, oh my gosh, if I get COVID, I'm never going to sing again. Cause I don't think that that's, they might not, they might not have the same respiratory capacity, but it doesn't mean that it's, um, that they wouldn't be able to sing. Would you agree with that? Oh, I lost your yeah, mind. No, sorry, definitely. Uh, I, I was just giving a worst case. Yeah. I had COVID. I had it back in March. Uh, mm -hmm. It was, it was horrible. Uh, for two reasons. Um, one was uh, the, the bad news about being a physician and getting this as I, I knew precisely what was going on in my body and, um, and, and that was, that was uh, scary. And the second thing is not knowing what the next moment was going to bring. And so for me, uh, because cytokines like to play at night, um, every night between 6 p.m. and 4 a.m. Uh, was a was a horror show. Think Rod Serling and uh, just, just chills and head hurt and just couldn't get comfortable. Cough, shortness of breath a little bit, not too bad. I never had to go to the hospital. But that knowledge that the next 15 minutes could I could deteriorate and then I know exactly what happens to me if I go to the hospital, right? And I know what looks like on the other side of seeing somebody on a ventilator, I would not want to be on, on the receiving end of that. Um, and finally, the horror, as you've heard, especially through the stories out of Manhattan, but it's everywhere, um, where a patient goes in and the family can't come with, and patients going on a ventilator, and the, pa and the family's not there, and some of them going on to die, and the family isn't there. And I can't think of a worst case scenario for a patient or a family, or for that matter, the healthcare worker who has to be that intermediary. This is a really, really bad disease. Yep. Uh, yes. I don't think anybody argues that, huh? Well, I, I have one uh, thought as you all were talking about, um, we've spoken a bit about the, the, the droplets. And I was wondering, what if you're in a class, an acting class, or if it, even a, a dance class, where there's no talking? Is that safe? Or whatever safe is? Whatever safe is. So, so if we look at some of the models that are coming out of athletic literature, so cycling, running, things like that, because if we're dancing, let's pretend we're, we are heavy breathing if we're working hard enough, right? <laughs> that there's a little bit of heavy breathing happening. Um, so, for example, they are not convinced that if, so in cycling, if you ride, just for those of you who aren't familiar with all the terminology, if you cycle, if you're a bike rider and you ride closely behind somebody, it's called drafting. Um, so they do believe that that airstream, you don't want to be riding directly behind somebody potentially. So I do think though, that if you are potentially spaced out far enough in a big enough classroom with ceilings, can you wear masks when you dance? Maybe. Um, can you wear masks in acting class? Maybe. Um, you know, this mask, I actually had one of the costume designers make for me because my patients need to see my mouth. And it has a window on it. So literally, I mean, you can't see it here 
because of the light. But is it possible that we would have some ability to see some of our faces um, with a mask on, even though it doesn't provide full protection? Um, and some of the more recent research I've seen, and maybe again, Dr. Sag, you can comment on this, but I've seen that um, when we look at some of the soccer players and some of these uh, professional sporting events, because if we think of our performers as vocal athletes and they're vocally fit, they're physically fit, that some of these more fit athletes um, actually do okay. Uh, from the standpoint of they, they don't really sometimes even show any of these kiddos coming back to school may actually have had it at some point. Um, and until we have testing or antibody testing that is consistent, I don't know that we know how many people have actually really had it. Mm -hmm. Well, I can address that a little bit, uh, sort of see them here. The reason, I don't know if we've talked about this, but the reason that we wear a mask is not to prevent ourselves from becoming infected. What it's doing is it's trying to contain those droplets or those small aerosolized particles from getting out and creating this sort of pig pen environment here. And so the, the way I like to say it to patients or others is that when a surgeon or the surgical team goes into an operating room, they wear a mask. They're not wearing a mask to prevent themselves from getting infected from the patient. They're wearing a mask to keep the surgical wound clean. So that's kind of the same thing here. Um, so I think rehearsals, I would guess, might be able to go well. Training could go reasonably well if you're wearing a mask. I mean, I work out in a gym where I wear a mask, even though I've had the infection. I, I do it for solidarity. <laughs> I want to, you know, I, can I get reinfected? I don't know. I'm hoping not, but it's possible. I could get reinfected. If that were the case, it's bad news for a vaccine because if actual infection doesn't lead to protective immunity, then it's unlikely a vaccine would. But I, I haven't heard any cases yet, it's kind of heartening, um, of, of uh, people who've been infected getting reinfected and becoming ill. So, so far so good. And so for at least several months, it's gonna be protected. But again, to reiterate, a mask is there to prevent the aerosols from getting out. And, and I don't remember if we mentioned this, but the typical distance is for the deep respiratory aerosols is six feet or so. If you cough or sneeze, it could go 10 feet. If you're breathing hard or singing and projecting, we've all been around, you know, when you're singing on stage, there's spit that comes out, right? And, and it can go as far as 10 feet. So um, that's, the, that's what we're trying to prevent. Thank you. Right. And oh, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I was also going to say the, the other guidelines that are starting to come out and please correct me if, if I need correcting, but um, we're seeing a lot of patients that are testing positive for a period of time after they are no longer, they're fever free for more than 14 days. And the CDC is saying that if you are fever free and after I, I, and I don't want to quote this, I will post it on there, but it's something like 10 to 14 days after the initial onset of symptoms. Even if you're testing COVID positive, they're allowing people to go back to work now um, because the RNA um, in the in feces as well as in the nasal shedding is sometimes lasting for two to three months, but they're not considering those folks necessarily contagious. Is that yeah, your understanding, that's Dr. That's exactly Sag? right. And it's, it's about just residual RNA of the virus that can be detected. There may be some productivity, but when you go to try to culture the virus, which means you stick a swab in uh, and you go into tissue culture and try to grow it, it doesn't grow really after 10 days after onset of symptoms. So they're using the 14 days to be a little bit extra safe. Um, but in fairness, we're all guessing, to be very honest, just guessing. And uh, uh, we're making, I think, educated guesses, but w this is all brand new. And so I think that concept resonates with me. I think it's correct. Um, 
but we will learn more as we go. But I think that's a good guidance for right now. I, I think that's accurate. Um, Dr. Sag, I want to pick up on one little thing that you mentioned about um, projecting um, droplets and all that if, as speaking or singing. So you're saying that, because you mentioned that it can be projected as far as 10 feet. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a lesson with, a, if you have a singer and a teacher, what's the recommended distance in that situation? Well, I think Wendy uh, has looked at that more than I have, but I would say at least 10 feet wearing a mask if possible, but I think it's hard to sing with a mask. I mean, mm -hmm. hard, you know, certainly if you're acting, you're covering up half of your expression or more. I mean, that's all part of the, I mean, yeah, you do a lot of acting with your eyes, but the rest of it's important too. So um, I think it's, it's gonna, it's a challenge for you guys. Um, uh, not to mention the audience being shoulder to shoulder, uh, which is sort of shut down Broadway, unfortunately for now. The, the 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 concept of uh, of the actors being at risk is is there as well. It's it, we're in a tough spot. So. Do you want to speak to that, Doctor Doctor Wendy? Sure. Um, so again, I think ten feet, uh, and I will have I have the articles for you guys pulled too on aerosol emission during regular speech, loud speech, etc. But I think one of the things, you know, we ask would plastic shields, would plexiglass, again, that goes towards the droplets. But the problem is, remember that the COVID cloud, these are nanoparticles. We're not talking about the big droplets. We're talking about the little ones that float high above. And they take a while to fall to the floor. And it also depends on how fast the room air exchange happens, and there's guidelines for that, but that's not realistic for every place to be able to know what their ventilation system is and would they be able to effectively change it. Um, I can tell you personally right now, um, my voice therapy patients where we're doing things like that is all done via telehealth right now. I am not seeing patients in the office for that kind of work because I can't do it with a mask on because I can't see my face. They feel safer where they are at the moment of time. Um, I'm only, and when I'm doing other procedures, I'm in full PPE, like goggles, N95, face shield, gown, gloves, hair, nets, the whole nine. Um, now, with that said, I know that some singing teachers are going back to singing or they're doing lessons outside. Um, I think we don't know all the answers yet, and I think you can be as safe as you can, but we don't know, and I don't know how. I saw an article in Forbes not too long ago, what is the liability risk for a university if a student gets sick? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, we have about 30 questions that have come in and we have about 12 minutes. Okay. So we're clearly not gonna get through them. So I apologize to all of our attendees. We have a lot of great questions in here. I feel like we've covered a couple of these and uh, hopefully we can pull these down and then maybe ask our guests if they have any additional things to add. Um, the one that's coming up a lot is that article that came out of Munich. And there is an article that was written where they claim the opposite, that singing isn't as hazardous. And so now that's getting spread around as justification to go back to singing, uh, you know, in lots of different groups. So I'm just curious if either of you have read that article and what thoughts you have uh, about its claims, its findings. Dr. Sag, have you, I have not read the whole thing. I've skimmed the abstract of it. I have not read the whole thing. I'll be keep my answer brief. I think it's wrong, bottom line, um, and and I don't think it's backed up by anything else. So um, I'd love if it were true. I don't think it is. That's the other problem is that we have a lot of information. Really, what's remarkable to me is that if you watch TV and you see all these talking heads, it's amazing how much the epidemiologists, the clinicians, etc., are all saying the same thing for the most part. Um, this is for us. Public Health 101. This is not terribly difficult. Uh, it's sorry. It's, it's it's pretty straightforward in terms of concept. It's very hard in terms of implementation of what we're what we know to do. Some countries have done it well. Unfortunately, the United States has not. 
Yeah. Um, I'm happy to, to fully read the article and provide my two cents, but the skim that I did of it, again, it comes down to numbers and how, what, how is the data processed? I know there's a study that is being done right now or being funded at the University of Colorado, I believe, looking at airflow and instruments. And yeah, I mean, I'm married to a high school band director. Like how much comes out over a flute versus a trombone? All of these things are really important, right? In our world too. Um, but when we have to look at things very critically um, and you gotta look at numbers, you gotta look at power in the study, you've gotta look at different conditions. And if things are funded by a group of individuals who are, potentially biased in a certain outcome, we just have to have that knowledge base. Not that it would be, but that we have to just be mindful of reading research critically when we take a look at, when we take a look at research. Yeah, I, I have another question that came to mind. It's, so the whole idea is we take temperatures and that supposedly will determine if you're, if you're safe to enter a building, but how, how safe is that? How much, how effective is that in determining if the, your environment is safe? To quote George Herbert Walker Bush, not going to debt, it's not going to work. Uh, <laughs> the temperature is late. It's not a great, so I would say ask anyone who feels the least bit off or sick to stay away. But even that isn't good enough for complete safety for what I said earlier. It's that asymptomatic period uh, the pre-symptomatic period, that 24 hours before symptoms develop, that you start to see peak transmission happening. And up to 50% of transmissions are occurring before someone even starts to feel bad, much less get fever. In my case, I didn't get fever till day six of illness. So that's not a very sensitive uh, marker, unfortunately. No. So I want to ask one that comes a little bit off of this uh, question coming in, but I think it helps address some of these things. Uh, clearly, we've been hearing, uh, I know Andre was curious about the vaccines. Is January realistic? I've been seeing some other things where people saying it's speeding up. But then the other thing I've heard written about is that even if we don't have a vaccine, if we get enough treatment options, it might change things. And yeah, I'm just wondering, Dr. We Sager, don't have a lot of time, so I'll be brief. Um, there's three ways this epidemic ends. Um, the best scenario is a vaccine. The vaccine um, has already shown to develop high levels of antibody. That's good. We just don't know. And they neutralize, which means it blocks of virus from entering cells in the laboratory. But does that protect? And that's going to take thousands of individuals who are exposed to demonstrate benefit. Earliest that I can see that happening is January. There's a pitfall. Sometimes antibodies can actually enhance infection. That's happened with other, with other viruses. So this could be a bad thing to get a vaccine. The studies will tell us. So if it happens the earliest as of January, which it could be, we could have efficacy data, um, then you got to mass produce for 600 million doses, probably. That's just for the US. For the world, it's going to be two to three billion doses, I'm guessing. So. The RNA viruses, uh, RNA vaccines that are being developed have never been used before in humans, and it's the primary candidate for this. So we're, this is like John Kennedy in 1960, whatever, when he said, we plan to put a person on the moon by the end of this decade. We're trying to do this by the end of this year. So it's a heavy lift, but I think we can do it. Uh, I'm hopeful, and that would be our best scenario. The second best is treatment, like you said. We have one treatment that works well right now. It's called remdesivir. It's IV, not what we need. It's good for people in the hospital. What we need is an oral pill like Tamiflu that as soon as somebody starts to get sick, pop that pill, stop replication, and prevent uh, bad morbidity from happening and prevent death. That pill, there are several in development. Um, I won't go through them, but hopeful for that. And that would be a next best case. And then we don't have to be as careful about people getting infected. And the worst case scenario, you can use your own imagination and figure out, but it's not pretty. It means that um, about two thirds of people in the world have got to become infected with this for herd immunity to, sn to snap it out. And I don't want that. I don't want us to go there. 
Yeah, yeah. I I have one more question. It's you sparked something in me there. It's without having a vaccine, even before the vaccine would be, if it's best case scenario, it's January, which we don't even know the efficacy of that. But we've heard a lot about the second wave and a lot of uh, departments and, and universities are having to come up with contingencies for what could possibly happen. So can you talk to us a little bit about the likelihood of the second wave and will it be different than the quote unquote first wave or do we even, of course, I mean, it's projecting, but can you tell us anything about what you think about that? Wendy, I don't want to dominate. Why don't you, if you want to take that? Or... You know, this is, this is your court, really. Okay, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't, I actually, I have speculation, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to venture to guess on that I one. I off stage. Okay, here we go. So, um, so here, here we go. So the, it depends on where you are and every epidemic is going to be local. So in my neck of the woods in Alabama, we're not, we're not done with the first surge. We're still rising. And I don't think it's going to end because our population doesn't have the gumption, wherewithal, commitment to do what needs to be done to stop the wave. So we're going to continue on a plateau that's rising. Um, and then when the fall happens, I'm very worried as we go more indoors, we're going to see a second spike. And that's going to be nasty, not because simply because of COVID, but it's also going to be the beginning of flu season. And for providers trying to distinguish between the two is going to be a nightmare. Right now in Montgomery, Alabama, there are no ICU beds left in the city. None. Zero. So they have to convert other hospital rooms into ICU rooms, use the emergency department, and send people elsewhere. And we're just at the beginning of the epidemic. We're at the beginning of the beginning. We're not even near the middle of this. So that's the stuff that hasn't really sunk in. Finally, I'm on several task forces here with the University of Alabama system. A lot of work is going in, like I'm sure at every one of your universities about contingency plans and all that. But we really don't know what's going to happen. I will tell you the dormitories are like a tinderbox. You've got people close quarters, a virus that spread this way. It's gonna, it has a potential to infect a lot of people very quickly. And so we've got to really implore our, our students to wear masks and be careful and keep distance. And how good 18 to 22 year olds are at that, I wouldn't bet my life on. I think the mask wearing, proper mask wearing, <laughs> blows my mind on a regular basis. Um, you know, that it does need to go over the nose and the mouth um, when you are wearing them. Um, I saw, I did see the comment pop up. I will make sure that I get that for you. But even in these masks, there's wire that will uh, go around my nose that's bendable. And in these windows, just so you know, like you have to use a little anti-fog. You can actually use either Dawn dish soap in them or like a scuba diver's anti-fog and it stays pretty unfoggy for a while. But putting your mask over your nose and your mouth and um, it's so important to get these, the, both students and faculty um, to wear them that way, um, for sure. It's a lot. So um, we have like still a good 34 plus questions. Um, uh, Molly's telling me that we'll have those downloaded at the end of this so that we can work on trying to figure out a way to get back to that. Um, I'm happy to talk with them about whether or not we need to have like another specialty thing with our MTEA voice group to talk about some of these things specific to voice teachers or if we can answer them in the written form. But uh, we will definitely do our best to try to get you uh, information on some of these questions as they're great. Yeah, and I want to take this time to uh, thank Dr. LeBourne and Dr. Sag for um, lending us their expertise and their point of view. We really appreciate it. Um, so now we're going to take a brief 10 minute break where you can stretch your legs, have a drink. But if you please keep your device nearby, we can tell you a bit about what MTA member benefits uh, will offer you. And we'll tell you about the upcoming conference in January. Thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to sign off. Is that okay? Okay. So, thank you, Dr. Sag. Thank you for having me. Good luck with everything. I admire everything you guys do. 
Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great profession, and um, I wish I had the talent to do it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing as well. <clears throat> so that concludes uh, the first section of tonight's uh, webinar. My name is Matthew Teak Miller. I am uh, the, one of the three vice presidents of Musical Theater Educators Alliance, an organization that I am so proud to be a part of. And while many of you rush to the bathroom uh, or even to the refrigerator to get a, another Michelob Ultra, um, I am going to tell you just a little bit about membership and how you can become more involved with this really wonderful organization. Um, as I share my screen, um, first of all, by, uh, by becoming a member of Musical Theater Educators Alliance, um, you are becoming part of an international network of musical theater educators. Uh, there are two types of memberships. Well, there are three types of memberships, but two that really would uh, apply to the people that are, are part of this webinar tonight. First of all, there's an individual membership for a, or a solo educator, uh, $100 for a year, and you get to become uh, part of this international network of musical theater educators. There's also a $300 membership for uh, for an, an organization, yeah, that would mean your entire department, your dean, your chair, uh, the people, the people that you work with every day. Um, and with that, you know, we currently have 300 members. I want to point out that we have had as many as 680 people joining us tonight. That means that over half of you aren't currently members. And now I'm going to call you out, Diane Lala, because I see that you're here. And CCM, it's time that you get an institutional membership. I'm looking at you. Okay, so uh, the way that we connect primarily uh, is uh, through our Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group where we are constantly, literally on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, sharing ideas and resources, posting questions. Hey, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? Um, and it's a wonderful way to connect with people, not just in your university or in your state or in the country, but really worldwide. Um, also, institutional memberships. It includes a listing on the most comprehensive musical theater training database accessible to prospective students for free. Uh, it's currently under construction um, and it's going to be a way that prospective musical theater students can look at the list and of uh, musical theater institutions around the country and really find the one that's best for them. Um, other membership uh, benefits include uh, discounted prices for our yearly or annual MTEA conference, which you're going to hear a little bit more about in just a moment, um, as well as a, an incredible new program uh, that we've got going on right now for junior faculty that um, pairs a junior faculty member going through the tenure and promotion process uh, with a mentor who is either an associate professor or a full professor someplace else that can take them through step by step what that process looks like. Many of us work in institutions where uh, we don't necessarily have the call, co our colleagues are on our committees. So we don't have colleagues that we can necessarily rely on and lean on as we are looking to go through one of the most stressful parts of our careers, that tenure process. Um, there's obviously many, many more opportunities to connect with people around the world. I've got to tell you, I've been a member for five years. I have made some of my closest friends through MTEA, through meeting them at our yearly conference and ke uh, keeping in contact with them. And it feels so good. We all live on an island in our departments around the country, and it feels so good to have people that we can connect with that are literally dealing with we, what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis around the country. So if you would like more information on membership, visit our website. It's musicaltheatereducators.org backslash membership if you want to go straight to that membership page and get, uh, get become a member today. Um, this concludes the NPR style telephone part of our uh, of our night. Now I get to hand it over to Jacob Brent, uh, another one of our vice presidents who is going to tell us a little bit about this year's conference, which is going to look and feel a little different than conferences in the past. Hello, thank you, Maddie. Hi, everyone. My name is Jacob Brent, and I am the Musical Theater Coordinator at James Madison University, and I'm also your Vice President of Conferences for MTEA. 
to this side. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that means that I get the um, great opportunity to plan the conference um, for next year. Me, along with a fabulous committee that we have, are busy, busy already planning this remarkable two days for you. Um, so this year's going to look a little different um, than the past. We usually either meet in New York or we meet at a regional conference and um, around the country. And this year we, we put a lot of thought into it, not knowing what was gonna happen, what we were gonna be able to do. But we really decided to, to um, take our conference virtually this year. And um, to be able to really take the time and really plan a, a really awesome uh, conference. And, and so we just decided to pivot early and go ahead and do that instead of having to run around at the last second and um, figure out how we were gonna move all this stuff online. Um, the good news is that a lot of it just transfers right over and um, we're gonna be able to bring you all that great content that we have. Um, now, I wanna share my screen, hold on. And just make sure that everything's clicked. Great. So um, now this is going to be a live virtual conference. It's not like it's un, it's not like the webinar that we're having tonight, which is really a one-way street of information coming to you. This conference is going to be two-way. We're going to be able to see you. You're going to be able to interact with us and interact with our great. Um, speakers and panelists, and we're going to be able to really connect with each other, which is really the, the best part of the conference. Um, the uh, 2021 MTA conference will be virtual. Uh, yes. And um, the dates will be in January. It'll be January 5th and 6th, 2001. So we don't have to travel anywhere. You just have to go to your, to your office or your home computer and um, you can be in your pajamas if you want. It's totally fine. But um, we, our goal is to bring you everything that you love about an in-person conference to, um, to you uh, virtually. So whether that's inspiring keynote speakers or informative breakout sessions or learning a new technique or an exercise or catching up with old friends, that is what we are going to do. We have not forgotten um, the coffee breaks. Some of the best memories that I have or have made at the conferences are just from hanging out with people, um, being able to see people, being able to see my friend Maddie from all the way across the country. Uh, and it's sort of our one time a year to get to connect. So um, that's awesome. And we're going to bring that to you. Okay. Um, tonight, I would like to premiere a little teaser for you, um, a little save the date teaser. So uh, let's see, hopefully it comes up next. Yes. Oh, we don't want to watch it twice. That's good. Thank you so much. And I hope you will join us in January. And um, I know you don't want to miss this. And it'd be great to have you all there. Um, I believe that the conference is open now. The registration is open. Um, soon a call for submissions will go out. So be looking at for that in the next few weeks. Um, if you are interested in presenting at our conference, we would love for you to be there and do that. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our next host. Um, he is the founding president of MTA, and he is the author of Acting in Musical Theater and Directing in Musical Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, I turn it over to Joe Deere. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the second and uh, the second part of this evening's webinar, um, we're going to be talking about performance solutions for this next hour. Um, the, the first hour was, was fantastic, and so thanks to all of you who hosted that and also to our guests. 
So that information is very sobering. It, 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 it puts an extremely clear contrast to kind of limitations we're going to have. And, and I noticed from looking at the chat and questions that there's a real desire to get what, um, what I heard one um, medical professional uh, call permission slips looking for ways to say, yes, we can actually do what we used to do. But I think that the data that Dr. Sag and Dr. LeBorn shared with us make it very, very clear that we're just not gonna be able to return to business as usual for, um, uh, for at least a semester and probably beyond that. So this next group of guests that we have are gonna talk about ways that we can engage our students in performance experiences um, so we can apply what we have managed to learn to teach them in our distance settings. And um, uh, so, so we've got a great group of people here um, from the major licensing uh, companies for uh, the, the shows that we end up licensing and um, sometimes the material we um, develop ourselves as well. So this, this panel is gonna be co-moderated by Matthew Teague Miller, Maddie Miller, who you met in the, um, the pledge break in between panels, and also Melissa Bensick. Maddie is the Associate Professor of Theater at Chico State University, and Melissa is the Founder and Artistic Director of Bravo Academy in Toronto. So um, uh, I'll, I will introduce our panelists just before we get to them, but I want to forewarn them so that they understand what the order is that they'll be expected to talk. We'll have Fred Stewart from Theatrical Rights Worldwide, Tim McDonald from iTheatrics, John Prignano uh, from MTI, Re Rebecca Schlossberg from Concord, and then finally, Melissa Bensick. So it'll be in that order. Um, we primed them a little bit in advance by saying, um, would you please talk on the following subjects, any of these things that are relevant to you and your organization. So what is your organization doing to help provide content and performing solutions that can work for us in whatever these new circumstances we're in? Um, what, what changes in your royalty structures and payment frameworks might you have come up with to help us as we're uh, trying to figure out how to pay for theater when we have virtually no um, box office revenue, what sort of streaming options, whether that's video on demand or Zoom or anything like that, when these shows in their new format are going to be available and the licensing agreements as well, what kind of classroom licensing options you have and anything else. And yes, we're asking them to do that in about eight minutes each. So we'll prompt them along a little bit, but just so that they can know what's going on. Now, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section of the box, of, of the um, uh, webinar rather than in the chat because Matt, uh, Maddie Miller is gonna try to go through and pull out most important questions. So all of that said, I think we understand the rules of the game. Um, uh, I wanna get started because I know our folks are gonna have lots and lots to offer. Um, yeah, all right, great. So let's go ahead and start, we'll begin with um, Fred Stewart. Fred is the Chief Creative Officer for Theatrical Rights Worldwide and has been with TRW since 2007, leading their marketing and social media and creative development of their growing Broadway and off-Broadway catalog for, the, for professional community and educational theater. And he's currently developing a series of new musicals with BMG recording catalog artists and a summer release of a new uh, rock musical in partnership with Madison Wells Media. So I'd like to welcome Fred Stewart. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Obviously, uh, our business is reeling like everybody else's. It's, um, <clears throat> we work, uh, as the other uh, agency reps can, can say, we, we work for authors and people who write musicals, and they are hurting like everybody else because not, not, not everybody is uh, as produced as everybody else. And so uh, our, our first uh, duty is to our customers, the theaters and the authors. And um, in listening to, you know, what you're specifically asking for in, in what to do in content solutions, that is uh, close to my department and to be honest about it, we're, uh, I worked with our CEO, Steve Spiegel today on reaching out to all of our customers, asking more than offering at this point of what's helpful because we've discussed every scenario from people want to cut intermissions and those of us who've run theaters 
generally say we either cut them or didn't anyway, but we know we're supposed to ask about these things, but more small cash shows, et cetera, is this helpful? You know, because this is our instinct right away is to say, well, we have these two handers, we have three handers, we have smaller casts, and uh, this could be helpful. As a former director and producer myself, it's, I put myself in back in a theater and said, I, you know, I don't, I, don't I, I guess it's helpful to have a small cast, and we're certainly then featuring those titles coming up. We also can't be in the business of encouraging theaters to get back until it's safe for them. So in marketing message, we're very uh, conscious of the need to be there with any kind of product, but not, not to also say, hey, you know, you could do this because we're not experts in safety. It was good to hear the other uh, panel who are, uh, but we're uh, going with more non-specific marketing at this point and and this bridges from you know content we are absolutely reaching out to our authors of, of all uh you know uh categories of work to ask them you know is there anything that occurs to you at this moment uh to write as everybody knows there's no magic wand to get a brilliant musical out fast so it's about repurposing existing material which is a, a lot of what we do anyway uh, from junior shows on on through the series, but the um, you know in developing content, we have a team that loves to do that, so we can hit the ground running. And our first thing, as I was saying, we're crafting an email that will go out soon to uh, customers everywhere, saying we, you may not know the answer to this, but. You know, we're kind of not at this point fronting that we have a bunch of answers for anything other than if you're ready to produce shows that we have, let's talk about, as you were saying, the costs are, are the, the, the first thing is, is ticket buyers are going to come back when they feel safe, when theaters feel safe. And uh, we're addressing that on two fronts. One is give us a call and say, hey, I want to do this title. I did the royalty thing. I got the quote back. And uh, I recommend that in the best of times. Uh, and so this, uh, everybody's anxious to see when theaters feel it is safe for them to test the waters on this and produce. So without being specific, because that is not my department, we have been discussing much. How does it look like when you're calculating royalty rental in the materials, uh, et cetera, for um, a scenario like this. So my recommendation is we're, we're a smaller company. We always have been more of a, you know, a, a boutique representation compared to our, uh, the other great agencies in the business. And so uh, like, I think they are too, but we're well able to take on personal inquiries. I certainly is running our social media have, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking and encouraging every day, but we're hearing, uh, everything from, hey man, we're gonna do the show, to, uh, and we're like, okay, great, and just, you know, uh, booking for the fall, but we've already put in a policy whereby people can leave existing bookings in place and um, gather, I think, 10 or 15% on that if they leave it, uh, and by and large refunds, and that have come and gone, and now we're, uh, you know, like everyone, looking to see the theater industry when it rebounds, also due to a variety of amazing things that are happening, what it will look like for all of us. Uh, and uh, the final one, I think on your, your point you asked for was, you know, in streaming, this is where, you know, a, as a panel representative, I'm certainly representing TRW and we are of a mind that, you know, it needs to be addressed right away. As a director, actor, I'm more like, mm, you know, video. <laughs> having it out there is my concern. And I think theater people want to be protected, really, of having their work out on, at best, HD on a, on a TV. And uh, knowing that it isn't a representation of their work, I, as a director, would be doing naughty things like, hey, man, if this is going streaming, too, I'm going to direct my show uh, to help that. Uh, but we're uh, working with our preferred ticket provider, Book Ticks, who are great guys, Jason Goldstein and his company, and we're launching in July, which we've already announced our Book Ticks Live thing, which is uh, essentially, uh, you know, how people can safely stream within what we're doing is saying, you know, with this comes your copyright protection 
and you do have to sell tickets through the book, uh, the book ticks platform, but it's a great platform. Uh, and this again is, uh, as we look at people rather than strictly encouraging it, we're saying, if this is helpful, then, you know, your reference camera might be good. If it's as much as saying a, a good portion of my family got to see the show. And this is addressing educational community theater, obviously in professional theater, the streaming thing is mercifully not my department. Uh, so that was, I think the three, uh, essential points yeah. that I yeah. hope are helpful. So if there's anything else, you let me know. Fred, this, that's great. Um, I, I think for a lot of us, it, because we're dealing with trying to get students in performance circumstances, it really is an extension, as you know, of, the, um, uh, of what we do in, in the education side of things. So us finding ways to be able to get them seen and performing, whether it's in a studio, whether it's on a stage with no audience or whatever. So I think having um, uh, streaming licensing agreements would be super helpful for us if that's something TRW can come to. Yeah, we're coming to it rapidly. Uh, many authors are very motivated to do it and have already agreed to it. Some, while it is generally in their purview to grant those rights, are tied up in film rights, which uh, for great shows like The Prom, uh, Spam a lot and others that do have uh, Hollywood uh, ties right now, that's a little bit of a different problem. On the other hand, we're encouraging them to say like, look, this, this will only help your property because we all know in theater, you know, if we're, it's only gonna help their property as well. So we're working with all the authors uh, on that. Great, thank you, Fred. We'll be back for more questions because they're pouring in on the, the, the question okay. and answer. But let's move on to our next guest. And that is Tim McDonald. He's head of iTheatrics. Uh, Tim is a prolific playwright and adapter and has worked with both Music Theater International and now with iTheatrics to develop innovative solutions to youth theater and educational theater performing. So uh, uh, Tim, welcome to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm um, still, uh, in, in, we're in phase one in New York City and it, it feels good to have a very dim light at the end of a very long um, tunnel. Thank you. So. Um, please share with us, I, I know I rattled off a whole bunch of bullet points. Anything you wanted to talk about to address those questions? Absolutely. Uh, um, I've got two points to address that. So uh, I developed symptoms for COVID um, on March like 13, 14th, 15th. Um, I did, I have since I was sick for about six or seven days, fever, blah, 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 blah. The mild symptoms, thank goodness. And while that was happening, my fever dreams um, included things like, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do theater? What's gonna happen to theater programs? What's gonna happen to community theaters, to universities? Um, I'm an alumni of California State University Chico and worked really hard to get that program um, started and built. And I'm so thrilled with Maddie and what he's doing there. And, Chico, a lifetime uh, dream for me and for uh, Chico State. But how do we do musicals in an age where we can't gather? And so I challenged my team at iTheatrics to figure out how to bend Zoom to meet the needs of Sondheim and Shakespeare. And we spent about a thousand hours of our time um, sorting that out and by um, April 7th, we had launched the world's first Zoomsical, the first uh, musical that was completely rehearsed and then performed on Zoom. And we learned a ton about that. And um, we are now developing more and more content of musicals that can be produced on Zoom. There's some really particular things. All of us who are on Zoom know that we can't speak at the same time. Um, you can't sing with someone at the same time. Um, if you're going to get multiple people um, on, on Zoom performing, then you have to record them separately. You have to put those together into a specific vocal track, which creates an ensemble singing. Mm -hmm. You then have to have them film themselves lip syncing, doing choreography and staging to that. And then that all has to be edited together. That's the hard side. The positive side that we found on Zoom is that when you record a Zoom 
musical live. So you start at the beginning, you perform it straight through the end. And some of the numbers, the ensemble numbers, are done via video, and that is played live. It is the best replication that we have found for that sensation of we're putting on a show. Um, entrances become turning on your video and making sure your mic is on. And for all of you who are on Zoom, how many times have you given your most impassioned speech only to be muted? So that's what we've been doing. Um, we, when we launched the, this first one, we got a lot of demand for people saying, hey, could you teach us what you know and how you've done it? So we've also um, hosted two different um, professional development sessions on how to Zoomsicle. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say we've had 237 people f all the way from Europe to New Zealand who have participated in this and who are now applying it uh, to their own um, purposes and to their own needs. Um, so, so that's one part that we were doing. The other thing is that, uh, as I mentioned, I was you know, bummed for Maddie and Chico State because here's this brand new BFA and we know already that they're not going to be meeting live and that it's going to be um, online and virtual learning. So Maddie reached out and said, you know, what do you have for me? And I have had a writing partner, very fortunate to have a writing partner for the last uh, six years, who is the New York Times bestselling author. Her name is Jody Pico. Jody loves musicals as much as I do. And um, she and I, um, our, our dear friends have been meeting every day and we decided in, in like week one, two of this that we needed to do something to memorialize what this has felt like and what has happened. Um, and, and Jody's point of view was like, I don't want to do it as a novelist because as novelists, we like to look back and, and tell that story. But musical theater is something that we participate in live with an audience. It's, it's immediate. So we wrote uh, five short stories together that we are using as a working title called The Corona Quintet. And it experiences couples, five different couples, as they go through the Corona experience in New York City. We've hired five incredible um, writing, musical theater writing teams, all of them different. And our goal is to make this, the work of this musical available through our universities. So it's brand new content, it's world premiere. Maddie has signed on board. We have uh, Coastal Carolina University, Adam, Adam Pelty is on board. Belmont University is looking at it as well. So I, I put that out there uh, also, that if you're looking for something that you can do, it can be rehearsed and performed online or in small groups or whatever that is. But to give content specifically to our universities that they can workshop and develop a new piece just really, really felt the right thing to do. Great. That's what I have to say. Wonder, uh, that's, that's exciting and, and, and some great solutions. I appreciate that and um, glad, glad to hear that you're doing well. Um, uh, and so I'm going to remind our, our attendees, uh, by the way, both, both of you, our, our first two guests have talked about you know, getting the word out. I think with 680 attendees at this uh, webinar, I have a feeling all five of the, your inboxes are going to be flooded and we're happy for that. Um, let's go to our next guest, and that is John Prignano. Most of us in um, uh, the educational world have called him John Prignano for years. And so I'm happy to set the record straight. Uh, John Prignano is the um, uh, Senior Operations uh, Officer for Music Theater International. John has been deeply involved in uh, theater and dance education for his entire career. And he has uh, uh, been central as an advocate for um, high school theater and for uh, educational theater, uh, especially through the Educational Theater uh, Association and the International Thespian Festival. So it's a pleasure to welcome you here, John. Hey, Joe. Hi there. How are you? Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so some of the things I want to discuss um, kind of just touch points on. One of the things we're really excited to talk about is I'm sure everyone's aware of our, our Broadway Junior uh, catalog. 
we are about to announce that um, our junior titles will be available for people to perform of any age. Um, this is something that, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with um, teachers and a lot of conversations with community theaters and, you know, the big questions have always come up of, you know, we need a small cast or we can't do an intermission. We're just not sure that people are going to be able to commit to enough time to do a two and a half hour musical. So, you know, we have our junior musicals, which are 60 minutes long and our kids musicals, which are 30 minutes long. They, um, they're a great solution for, for that problem. Um, you can also, you know, work, you know, if you're not, if you don't want to do with a big cast, you, we all would allow you to on parts and make it more of a TYA option for people who need that. Um, as you know, the shows come fully orchestrated and, uh, so it's everything you need right in a box and it's the, uh, it's a great way to be able to get back on the horse, so to speak. John, and John, when you say fully game. orchestrated, are you referring to having tracks and that kind of thing? That is them? correct. Okay, thank you. We have, we have tracks that are fully orchestrated, correct. Um, one of the other things I wanna point out is, and this is, MTI has been doing this for years, and it's kind of like a secret, and I don't know why, but um, <laughs> we offer things called classroom licenses. These are for people who want to study a show or stage the show within their classroom where they're not doing a performance, they're not you know, doing invited um, or selling tickets or inviting people in to see a performance. These are, they're, you, they're, they're a full license, they're reduced royalty licenses. Um, usually we give you materials a little longer because people wanna do it for maybe a semester as opposed to just the eight weeks that we normally give you. Um, so that's something to think about also is doing those in your classroom. Um, and I don't know why we just do. Um, next, um, royalties. I know, you, I know you mentioned uh, reduced royalties and stuff. What we're doing right now is we, we're allowing people to process a license without needing a security deposit. Meaning um, the way our license read currently is you must have a, a signed license with a minimum of your security deposit before you can start selling tickets and announce your show. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is sign the contract. We still need all of the payment before the materials get released, but we don't need that security deposit any longer at the beginning for you to start selling tickets and um, for you to start announcing your shows. Uh, so John, on that, on that, and I know that this is a question probably all our panelists will wanna to touch on later. Sure. Because we're looking at either having a radically reduced audience size. My, my auditorium might seat 400 people last year, but this year, if I'm lucky, I'll be able to seat 125. So will you be adjusting royalty, royalty agreements to that new size? Absolutely. I mean, royalties have always been based on your gross sales. So if you're going to tell us you're selling 400 seats, we're going to quote you at 400 seats. If you're telling us you're selling 125 seats, we will quote you on 125 seats. Uh, the one thing that we also do is, you know, we always like to make people aware of, if for some reason you tell us you're licensing 400, you want to sell 425 seats, and you find out that your performance is the same weekend as homecoming or, I don't know, pick something. There's always something, right? Um, <laughs> pick something. And you've only ended up selling 100 tickets. You need to let us know that. If you let us know within seven days of your last performance, we will actually requote those royalties for those performances. Even if it's just one performance, we will requote it for that one performance. But it's better for you to do that than, than happy to do that for you. you know, of course, you're going to have to send this box office receipts and all of that to show that you've only sold 100 seats, but we're happy to do that for you. The big, the big thing is it has to be within seven days because 
after that date, money starts to get processed and we pay stuff out to authors and things, the ball just starts rolling. Um, the other thing we're working on, which we're really proud of and we're gonna be announcing very soon, is we're working on a streaming platform. We've partnered with Show Ticks For You and we've partnered with um, Broadway Media. And we're building a platform where you can sell your tickets, stream your show, and your royalty to figure out percentages and box office and all of that afterwards. Um, it's a proprietary website that is being hosted by Showtix for you. There's more information on their website if you want to uh, know more information. It's uh, our launch date will be, fingers crossed, uh, June 18th. We're gonna be doing a press release this Monday on the 15th, and we're gonna start um, technical webinars starting on the 16th. Um, so if you're interested in more information about how to stream, what it is you can stream, all of that technical stuff, um, please uh, go to Showtix for your website and sign up for the webinars. Um, the options in streaming, we're, we're, gonna, we're trying to give you three options. The first option obviously is live stream, which is where you capture the performance as it's taking place from your stage. Um, that's a, what we're calling a live stream. Mm -hmm. um, you sell tickets as if you were doing a show, you sell the tickets and you love watching. The second one, we're, we, the second option is called a scheduled stream. It's kind of a hybrid of on demand and live. And basically what it is, is say you ha you've did your dress rehearsal on a Wednesday. You capture your dress rehearsal on a Wednesday, and then you schedule it to be played on Friday at eight o'clock, Saturday at two o'clock, Saturday at eight o'clock, Sunday at three o'clock. And you play back literally that recording at those specific times. That is what we're calling a scheduled performance. And the last option is what we're calling based on demand. And basically it's, you know, your standard kind of Netflix option where the, you purchase the show and you get to watch it within a certain period of time. Um, Wow, I just plowed through all that, didn't you I? You did, you're great, John, I appreciate it. Um, I, I have a feeling that if you could see the chat, I hope you're not looking at it because it's going a million miles an hour. But um, there are- I'm, all, I'm only looking at you, Joe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there are uh, certainly gonna be people who want sort of um, FAQ sheets for all of, from all of our licensing representatives here. And, and, and we will be putting together uh, proceedings from this webinar uh, to, to be able to, to disseminate to anybody who's an attendee. Uh, uh, so, so that would be great. If there's anything you all want to share, we can get it to Molly Garner who contacted you all. Right. And Alan Patrick Kenny, who is the moderator for the third hour of this, mentions that Show Ticks for You is going to be one of the people joining us in the third hour. So there'll be more information about that. Okay, great. But very, very useful. Thank you as always, John. Great. Thank so let's Let's move on to our next representative. Uh, this is Rebecca Schlossberg. She is the amateur licensing coordinator for Concord Theatrical. Concord is the overseeing organization that administers rights to plays and musicals from, uh, among others, the Rodgers and Hammerstein, the Samuel French, and the Tams Whitmark catalogs. Uh, Rebecca. Joe, thank you. Um, hi. Um, yes, so um, as Joe said, um, my name is Becker Schlossberg. I'm specifically the um, collegiate and university coordinator for um, Concord Theatricals. Um, so I work specifically um, with y'all. Um, so um, at the beginning of this crisis, um, Concord, uh, you know, we're in a sort of a kind of an opposite problem. Um, in that with our Samuel French catalog alone, we have over about 10,000 titles. Um, in addition to, you know, hundreds more that we have with um, the other branches of the Concord Division, um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, Tams Whitmark, and uh, Rogers and Hammerstein. So um, our literary and acquisitions teams uh, 
did a wonderful job in reaching out to our authors um, to try and see if we could secure what, what we've kind of defined as digital rights and virtual rights. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and uh, I will also share actually in the chat. Um, so we very quickly developed a list of like yes titles where our authors gave us blanket approvals um, for these permissions and no titles where um, our authors did not approve of this. Um, you know, kind of echoing what other people have said, but you know, we, we really found ourselves in a position trying to moderate between the needs of our customers, you guys, and um, you know, meeting the needs of our authors as well. Um, so, um, so we do have that yes and no list. I will share those links. Um, we also, not a musical, but we did develop um, a virtual per, um, like production script for She Kills Monsters, which is one of our most popular plays. Um, it's a play actually that Queen Nguyen, the author, came to us about in terms of developing a virtual version. Um, version. Um, he um, felt that it could easily be adapted for a virtual format um, and uh, made some tweaks to the script. And um, so that's a, a play that we already have those blanket permissions for. Um, so in regards to pricing, we're, we're pretty much for um, digital and virtual rights. Um, we're essentially charging our minimum fees and then um, additionally sort of basing it on how many days your content will be online and available uh, for your audience. Um, so, and our minimum fees are listed um, on a, a, a great deal of the pages on our website, on our title pages. So that's a, it's a good reference to look. Um, and so, yeah, so in terms of digital and virtual rights, I should also note if a title that you are interested in is not on either of those lists, it doesn't necessarily mean no. Um, it just means that we have to check permissions for you echoing on what other people have said, but sometimes our titles are caught up in movie deals or tour deals and tours are so up in the air right now that I think those tour producers are kind of scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. Um, so, um, but we have completely opened up requests for this. So um, I've always encouraged people to go ahead and apply for rights to something um, if you are interested in. So we have two sections now of our licensing application for digital rights and virtual rights. The digital rights for us is meant to be your actors performing together in a physical space, but to little or no audience. And then that content is live streamed to your audience at home. Um, the virtual rights is meant for your actors to be together only in a virtual space, an online platform like we're doing right now, like via Zoom. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and then going ahead and, and performing that way and virtual and, and live streaming that content to your audience, your ticket buyers. Um, we've added a couple of protections in place um, when all this happened to try and, you know, as I said, protect our authors as well. We're asking for password protections so that the content can't be, you know, readily found online or like invited subscri uh, subscribers. Um, we ask that the stream be deactivated after a certain period of time so that the content is removed and not available online. Um, we ask that uh, you put up a copyright notice um, and crediting for our authors, of course. Um, so those parameters are, are all listed out in the agreement that you would get from us. For payment plans, um, we did develop a, a payment plan for, um, you know, all producers um, in regarding, you know, uh, Payments for us are usually due within 90 days of your execution of the agreement. Um, so we have extended that time period. We've also allowed people to put down an initial installment and then pay the remaining balance 90 days after that point. But you pay the initial installment, you can announce, audition, advertise, and essentially you know, begin production. Um, I'd also just quickly say that while this isn't digital or virtual rights, we have been very flexible as well with our cancellation policy. Um, you know, even if it's someone uh, now postponing a show, canceling it down the line due to COVID, we would still accept that. Um, we're also allowing a postponement policy that allows producers to postpone and hold on to their books for the next 18 months with no additional fees. Um, I imagine that time could be extended as well if that was necessary. Um, and we've also uh, suspended our music materials uh, return policy right now. So. Uh, folks can hang on to their books and not have to worry about losing their deposits or being charged fees. Um, so that just, just made a lot of people very happy. Good. I'm very glad. 
that's that's fantastic, Rebecca. Um, the um, the 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 flexibility that you and the other licensors are showing is really helpful, because as everybody in the first hour said, and now we're just trying to invent this thing, and ultimately the maximum flexibility that you can provide us in terms of um, fee structures for these different because what we're all facing now is producing theater with little to no income and most of the organizations that you're talking to here are people who depend largely if not solely on box office to run their educational programs so it's all wacky we've got a, we've it's broke but we'll we'll figure out how to fix it Great. We're going to have more questions in a moment, so I want to move on. Um, our, our final uh, panelist is um, Melissa Bensick. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Melissa is one of the moderators and uh, creators of this panel, and she's been fabulous for us uh, in terms of resources that she's developed with the uh, Bravo Academy, which is a private institution that she runs in Toronto. She works extensively in developing innovative performing arts programming, She's a producer, director, voice instructor, uh, adjudicator, and clinician, and she teaches both at Bravo and at other institutions in Canada. And she's particularly passionate and effective about developing new works. So, Melissa, welcome to you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for having me here today. Yeah. And I'm very excited that I'll be able to share our journey about what we've been doing in producing online musicals during COVID. Um, just, just to start my theater and what our organization has simply done is just found ways to pivot in order to continue to provide arts education and performance opportunities for our students. So like you said, I run a performing arts school. Uh, we have over 300 students registered in private lessons and music theater classes and productions. And we were very fortunate that within one week of closures, we were able to move our entire faculty and programs and rehearsals online. We initially hoped it would be temporary. We were working on the musicals Mystery of Edwin Drood and Mary Poppins, and <laughs> unfortunately, we had to uh, cancel our productions. Um, so like so many others, we tied up our final shows doing virtual music theater choirs and cast parties. But the final cast parties, they were very emotional and there, were, there was a lot of tears. And we knew clearly that our students really wanted to continue and how valuable this was. So we started our journey to find innovative solutions to continue to work with our students and our faculty. So we, we actually began this right away in March. Um, so first off, moving private lessons online and everything else was, and then music theater followed suit. We offered our teachers resources that were available, training and support. And fortunately it was a pretty quick, smooth transition. Our, the presenting productions, as we're hearing now, even listening to licensing houses, was our greatest, greatest challenge. We produce over 25 musicals per year, youth shows, full length musicals and new musicals in development. So we needed to find a solution um, and we never wanted to cancel a show again if we didn't have to. So our goals were really to find and produce musicals that we could present online that would be educational and challenge our artists, uh, shows that would create an interactive and inclusive learning environment where all students are engaged, being featured and fully part of the process. Since we don't know when we'd be able to get into the theater out here in Toronto, um, in order to achieve these goals, our mission was clear. The, to quote a Beat by Press musical that we produced, the show must go online. So what we did is we researched and then we double checked our research to uncover any and all musicals that could be performed virtually. So in order to compile this data, we looked at everything that all the various licensing houses everywhere uh, had available. We reached out to NAMT to find out, are, is there anyone that might be writing digital musicals that we that may not find on a licensing house? We connected with writers about the ideas of potentially commissioning new musicals. Um, we have read and watched everything that's been produced online. And just a shout out to Tim at iTheatrics. My son and I loved all of your, your shows and that was, they've been fabulous. We've also revisited new musicals that our organization has previously developed to see if there was anything there that could be adapted to a virtual format. In the end, what we did and what we are doing is, is a little combination of everything. 
So our first big project was a musical called Super School. It was originally commissioned uh, to take place as an in-person spring teen intensive. And we're very fortunate that the writing team and the artistic team so open to the idea of adapting the show virtually in such a short period of time. We approached them in March and we started rehearsals and auditions in April. So it was a very quick turnaround, but everyone was on board. We didn't know exactly how we were going to produce it. We had to learn and check out every software, everything that was available. And one of my colleagues will be speaking um, at the next panel about the how we actually did this performance, uh, did the rehearsals. Um, but we felt that we could try and we wanted to give it a shot and had a lot of ideas. Everybody was on this journey together. Uh, the students were learning how to learn and us teachers were learning how to teach. And nearly the entire artistic team and cast never met each other. So it was a real Zoom experience. It was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and learning a new musical always presents its own, um, own challenges. But in the end, it was a huge success. We learned so much about producing musicals online. Um, and it was such a beautiful experience, I can say, uh, that we'll, we will always remember and everyone will treasure it forever. And I just want to share a couple anonymous quotes from some students um, that sh was shared on closing night with us. They said, during this time when so much was uncertain, it, was, it felt so incredible coming here to be part of something. Another one said, I was worried about my mental health, but this project kept me going. And lastly, one said, I'm so grateful I got to continue to do what I love. So this really was a motivating factor. So then in addition to having our skill classes online, so dance program, voice lessons, piano lessons, um, we continued to produce and are producing more live musicals. So the, the different options that we're using is, yes, we produced that one new musical development. Um, we're also producing licensed virtual musicals. So ones that MTI has had available, uh, has available right now. We've done the show must go online. We have some stuff lined up for our summer camps. Where we sort of struggled was finding material for our older students. So the teenage plus age. So what we did is we reached out to local writers uh, that have worked with us before um, and to see if there's any shows that they'd be willing to adapt that could work for these age groups, uh, shows that we've done like Drama 101 or Going Under that we've developed, and, and very fortunate that many of these might be options to develop. We've also done workshops, so we keep doing new musical workshops with students. It's been really fun. We're looking at commissioning options and getting more material out there and existing shows and like I, it was great to hear some of the licensing houses talk that we kind of went through the catalog and I was looking for shows that would really I felt would work in an online format and reached out to those writers and then the licensing houses to see you know if any of those authors and if it was permissible and is permissible to do some of those shows you know we're doing stuff at the Toronto Virtual Fringe Festival mm -hmm. uh, so we're keeping active in in the end what I will say is that technology is constantly changing and the way to do this is constantly changing and please don't underestimate the cost of video editing and equipment, but it is all possible and it is all manageable. There's so many different ways of doing it um, and the resources like that we're hearing from the panelists today. It is incredible what is out there now and the support that you get. So I just think it's so wonderful and it's not perfect. I don't think it's going to replace live theater but it has been a really rewarding, heartwarming and inspiring journey to keep doing this with the students. Wow, that's, that's just absolutely fantastic, Melissa. Um, so Maddie, I know that we're pressed for time here, but we do, have, we do have seven or eight minutes left. Do you want to pull a couple of questions that you think might be good for the whole, um, the, the whole panel to- So look how efficient I am, I already did. So um, I, I would love to, real quick, Tim, I saw that you touched base to some people in particular, but one of the biggest questions that we got in our, in our Q&A uh, was whether or not iTheatrics was going to be offering any more Zoom musical trainings. Um, is that something you guys are going to be doing? And if so, how do people get on the list? Um, thank you. We, honestly, we hadn't planned on it because we... Um, we pivoted our entire offerings online. And so we're in the middle of our, we're not in the middle, we're in week two of this new virtual summer camp universe as you know, we all do. Um, having said that, um, if there's enough interest, we would be happy to do it um, because we've, we've, we've done all the research and we could tell you the settings and how to make sure there's privacy. 
and, and you know, make sure you're not getting people who are like jumping into your Zoom room and doing terrible things or just like spamming you. Um, and on top of that, just how to rehearse and all those techniques. It's a two day um, extravaganza. It's about um, uh, four hours of PD. So just email me. I sent out my um, email at tim at itheatrics.com. If there's enough, enough interest, we'll absolutely do it because um, here's the thing. It, the, this online component of what we're doing, I don't look at it as a way to survive. I look at it as research and development. And it's a way for us to reach students that we could never reach, um, either because they're in rural areas or they're not uh, a population you serve. So let's take advantage of that and let's bring theater to as many people as we can in any way that we can. And technology could do that, sort of. Awesome, thank you, Tim. So uh, Rebecca in the chat had posted Concord's list of available titles as it stands right now. I was curious if John um, and Fred could tell us what MTI and TRW have planned in terms of rolling out the, the, the catalog list that you all have available or will have available soon. Um, John, would you like to go first? Talk to us a little bit about that, the timeline on that. Sure, the timeline is um, we will, we're going to be announcing the platform first and talking about how the platform works. Titles will be announced around the 18th, uh, which is next week. Um, and we're feverishly working on getting authors to agree and getting titles and figuring out which version of streaming they want to do. But uh, yeah, right around the 18th is when we'll be announcing all of our titles together. Awesome. What about uh, TRW, Fred? Fred, you're muted. Am I back? Pardon me. You are. Yeah, there you are. We, uh, we're about in the same boat as John mentioned, um, as we work with our teams of authors to, to clear these. And as I said at the outset, we have, uh, like most people, a few titles that are tied up in uh, Film rights, <clears throat> and the prom was also not, not available yet, but uh, as uh, one thing that did not come up, as tours, unfortunately, may be the last to come back, uh, some shows that were formerly restricted, I think, across agencies uh, may well at least be worth uh, people looking into. But as far as our exact list of, of what is open right now, it is everything except for a handful of the Broadway titles, which we'll clarify when we announce. That's awesome. Okay, great. So then another question that we had similar but slightly different was um, Rebecca mentioned about She Kills Monsters and how it was adapted specifically to work on an online platform. Um, does anyone else in their catalog have um, things that will be going through a similar transition that might be adapted to specifically fit this format? Fred, you're muted again. I'll, I'll get better at that. We are, which I'll send out in a moment, an EPK for our musical bear, which as we look at our titles, we're like, which ones really might lend themselves to that format? And that title came up right away, so I'll pop that in, in into that. But uh, we're also, as I said at the outset, while we are developing, we're, as usual, looking for customers to lead by asking us, hey, can we do this or thus and such with the title, which we've already gotten a lot of very creative questions. And John, what about MTI? Is there anything that's gonna be specifically adapted to be done virtually? Um, you know, we're working through um, trying to get those rights and, and trying to figure that out. Um, our big focus has been on streaming and streaming rights and understanding how all that works um, more than it has been the virtual side of it. Um, but you know, we're, we're um, always looking for options. And as, as Fred said, you know, if you guys, if, if there are people who think something would work well, reach out to us, always ask the question. Um, you know, you, we're always willing to, to go back to the authors and see what their thoughts are. 
That's fantastic. We've got one minute, and I think this is a really interesting question that I'm just going to throw at all, all of you, um, and I'm going to read it because I think it's articulated better than my, anything I would paraphrase. It says, in light of B Black Lives Matter and what is happening right now, uh, are there any plans in adapting uh, the issues of racism in musicals, particularly some of the older musicals? Um, and I'm going to, uh, it goes on a little bit more as it lists some, but I'm just curious if, if you all have any sort of insight as to whether or not some estates may be open to bringing some of these titles into the 21st century. Um, yeah, hi, I can, I can talk a bit about that. Um, so um, th this is an issue that has been ongoing for a while now. Um, it is always something that um, has been on the minds of folks at Concord, um, each of the, you know, um, once separate houses and now, you know, all of us together. Um, and we are constantly sort of evaluating our scripts and, and analyzing them and seeing if they hold up. Um, I would also kind of echo what Fred was saying about um, hoping our customers sort of reach out to us. Um, how would you update this for, um, you know, the 21st century and uh, what are the changes you would make? And often authors and composers are very amicable to those kinds of changes. Um, I think they want their shows to stay current and to not be offensive. Um, so um, there's, uh, for things like that, um, you know, we we accept those kinds of proposals and changes, and we work as best we can with our authors to um, make it happen. So that's a. I'm gonna just cut you off there because we are out of time. And and you know what? As we're having this conversation, that question in particular, um, Jacob Brent is texting me saying. Maybe we should get these guys, these people on a panel uh, at our upcoming uh, virtual conference so that we can have some more conversations about that very thing because it is, that would be a very exciting um, conversation to have more than one minute for. Um, um, thank Maddie, you. Maddie, if I can jump in with you on that. Um, I, a reminder what, what uh, Tim Espinoza said at the beginning of this uh, webinar was that we will be new uh, another webinar that it specifically addresses race and musical theater education and musical theater performance so um i i, I think that this certainly is going to be a big piece of that so go, go ahead and wrap yeah. up thank you yeah absolutely i was just going to say thank you so much to our our panelists i mean it feels a little bit like the god father and getting everybody, all the big powerful families in the room at the same time. Um, and I guarantee that that conversation would have been longer than 50 minutes in The Godfather. So thank you so much for making this time. I'm going to hand the baton over to a uh, 10 minute break for those of you that are crossing your legs and, and ready to go to the bathroom. But don't go to the bathroom if you can help it because we're going to talk a little bit about the MTEA Academic Journal, the only American musical theater academic journal that's published uh, strictly here in America, MTEA, and our editor-in-chief, Amelia Rollins Bigler, is going to tell us a little bit about the upcoming journal and submissions. Thank you all so much for that wonderful panel. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, my name is Amelia Rawlings Bigler, and I'm currently Assistant Professor of Voice, uh, Musical Theater Voice at Western Kentucky University. And I'm really excited to have begun my first year as Editor-in-Chief of the MTA Journal, taking over for the fabulous Tracy Moore. Uh, so we are currently open and looking for submissions for the journal, and you do not need to be a member of MTEA to submit. So our current deadline is going to be July 15th of 2020. And for inf more information, you can go and visit our website and go to the journal tab. And that's actually what I'm gonna show you right now. There we go. Okay, so hopefully you all can see that. Uh, so all you're gonna do is just go to the MTA homepage. You can click on the journal tab. 
and it's going to take you to our journal page where you can download the most recent ver version of the journal, which is beautiful in all of its glory, uh, that was published in January of 2020. Our next issue is again going to come out in January of 2021. If you scroll down, it says want to be published and you simply click on that and you can view the guidelines for publication in the journal. Uh, it tells you that we are typically focused on the college level, but we do welcome submissions in other areas. Uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, but feel free to reach out to me if you have any ideas or want to bounce an idea off of me. Uh, it lists here the subject areas uh, that we typically have for our articles and submissions. There is no limit on the requirement or length. And of course, all of our, our guidelines are written here for your publication. Uh, we do have articles which are peer reviewed. We have pedagogical and teacher's toolkit pieces, which are non-peer reviewed. We love interviews with, with any, anyone in the industry uh, that can help us in what we do in the everyday studio and on the stage with feature submissions and really importantly, book, cast album and performance reviews. And so once you have finished your article and want to uh, submit it, you just simply go to the website and you can press start and submit it there. If you have any further questions, or again, if you want, if you have an idea for a piece, you're not sure if it would work with what uh, we're currently kind of looking at right now, feel free to reach out to me via email at journal at musicaltheatereducators.org. And, um, and I would be more than happy to uh, talk to you there. So if, and, and if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to uh, address them to me in the chat and I'll stay around for just a few more minutes and give you feedback there too. All right, so I think we've got about five more minutes for our break, uh, and then we're going to go to Alan Kinney. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alan Kinney in case he wants to help that, that transition into the next portion on technology. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, I'm really excited to sort of bring in the third hour where, where we get to really roll up our sleeves and figure out how we're going to do some of this stuff. Uh, it is a challenging time, and uh, I'm really grateful to be a part of MTA, and I'm so grateful that they asked me to be on this panel. Um, I don't know if uh, some of you had a chance to watch our uh, our MTA uh, thrown together webinar that happened in March on two days notice for uh, for teachers who were looking for um, uh, technological solutions on how to pivot online um, that uh, is available on MTA's YouTube channel and has right now over 2200 uh, 2200 views um, and had 150 participants in two days notice so we're really grateful that um, that this uh, has only increased and that we're coming together to uh, bring on some solutions so I know that some people are, are away from the break um, and hopefully the video will get put on me soon uh, but in the meantime I will tell you that we have lots of really exciting guests that are joining us, uh, starting with Show Ticks for You. Hello, there we go, my Pixar background for technology. Uh, we have uh, the founders of Show Ticks for You that are going to talk about their show share streaming platform. Um, and then we have a uh, music director and composer and lyricist Daniel Abramson, who um, has worked on those virtual musicals for Bravo Academy. So he's going to tell us a little bit about the technical ins and outs of how we did that. Um, then we have uh, my friend Jeff Lazarus from Real Time Music Solutions. They've just launched a rehearsal live share component to their um, wonderful software programs, including Symphonia, Coach, and Mix um, from RMS. Uh, then we'll have Tim Espinosa from Fullerton College talking about acting, performance, uh, and lecture solutions for online and hybrid classes. And then I have a bunch of links for all of us to talk about um, live streaming cameras and apps and music theory uh, and ear training uh, software solutions and anything that we need to do for whatever happens in the fall. So we have a lot going on. Um, I'm going to try to keep my eye on the chat and on the Q&A um, and we're going to work through to get uh, as many of these questions answered. Uh, please know that I'm not going to read all of our, uh, our presenters bios because they're in our resources. Uh, so those are all collected as well as a bunch of PDFs about things that we're going to talk about and also things that we're not. Um, there are so many resources out there right now for um, uh, delivering Zoom voice lessons and we have, uh, I read, read, so we're going to try to give you some different information today um, that are helpful um, with some, with the new frontier that we're going to be facing this fall. Um, okay, so without further ado, I, I know I'm a minute early on my clock, but I like early. Um, let's bring on Steele Wallace and Jeff Tidwell from Show Ticks for You to talk about 
their new production streaming platform, which is called ShowShare. Hi there. Welcome. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much for having us. Um, so you guys are actually the very first people who get to see the platform that we're creating. Uh, we've been working so hard in the last uh, two months uh, to develop something that would normally take us about uh, probably eight months to uh, accomplish. Um, and so I'm going to just start and show a high level view of the software and then I'll actually uh, share my screen and uh, show you uh, how it actually how it functions. Uh, so, but first, before I uh, start with that, I want to thank you all very much for all you do to share the arts in your communities. Um, pandemics have existed for, and, and, uh, for centuries and have shaped our communities. The, the high ceilings we see in buildings, the sewers uh, that we have, these things we take for granted have shaped our communities. And theater has existed for centuries. But never ever in the history of time has the level of innovation that we have today. And so we feel we're sitting at a moment right now, we're sitting at a moment that will also shape theater and history. And it's important that we do this correctly in a sensitive way and with respect to the live theater. And so as we created this platform, we came from this place. Jeff and I are live theater guys. We grew up in Vegas together doing live theater and then we moved into software. We developed software for live theater. And so our platform is coming from a place of live theater. So there were a couple key elements that we sat on before we started to uh, create this platform. Those two key elements that we just kept coming back to is that this platform needs to be live theater first and streaming as an extension of our live theater. Um, it is not a replacement for live theater. It will never be a replacement for live theater. And we want to make sure our platform is respectful of those concepts. And this was our key, first key element as we developed the software. The second key element that we felt was necessary for a successful platform uh, is around the word accessibility. Um, it being accessible, easy to use, not about the platform, but about celebrating your shows and letting the technology get out of the way so that it's about you and the show and your community. Accessibility, imagine this, imagine now you selling more tickets than you've ever sold before because um, people can stream now and people can show up to the theater. So we, we picture kids for the first time now, maybe who have never experienced the theater, never they, maybe they had never had someone who could take them to the theater or never had the financial means to go to the theater. Maybe that kid's first experience will be watching a stream and their second experience will be walking through the theater doors. We see this again as a very special moment in history. Um, and also accessibility in the sense that the military families, the grandma in Florida who can finally see their grandchildren do a show. Again, celebrating live theater um, is really a key element of our platform. Jeff and I grew up in Vegas in the 80s and we would have TV blackouts when all the sporting events would be in town in Vegas. And the sporting events would not sell out, they were moder moderately priced. A new generation of people showed up in Vegas and they said, no, no, let's televise these games that are happening. And all of a sudden this energy started and the game started selling out and the prices started going up. And that energy really excited um, that whole market. We think the same thing can happen in the theater market, again, if we create a platform that is respectful of the live theater. So those were key elements. And hopefully as I quickly, I only have like three minutes to show you the platform, but hopefully you'll see those key elements um, as I'm showing you. Uh, the site. So bear with me because I need to share my screen and I've got to move things around. <laughs> so hopefully I'll do this correctly here. So I'm going to share my screen and there we go. All right. So again, you guys are the first people to actually see some of this and apologize. I'm going to move some stuff around here. Perfect. All right. So first, just showing you some things on the home page. Um, one, another very important element is understanding that our platform here, it is a live theater ticketing platform that now has streaming as an extension. 
This can be used for your shows, but imagine this, it can also be used, let's say you want to create your own educational area where you're going to teach tutorials and monetize it. Maybe it's, you want to do a cooking show. Um, maybe it's a, um, a classroom project. These are all things that you can do on the platform um, outside of actually doing productions. Another thing to keep in mind about this technology and platform is it can create an extension of your technical theater department. So your technical theater department all of a sudden can grow because now you need videographers, now you have editors, um, and maybe you have uh, different kinds of sound engineers. So you can actually grow your program. And hopefully you'll see we've tried to make this as simple as possible. So um, the other thing is, I think John from MTI mentioned this, but for video on demand capabilities, video on demand means you have extra fundraising power because after the show, um, it's a rental of watching it. So for alumni to come back and watch an old show, they're renting it. So it has extra fundraising power. John mentioned the three types of streaming that we offer, live streaming, that's live streaming a live show, video on demand, that's pre-recorded content that people are renting, and scheduled content, which is a watch party that is scheduled, con uh, sorry, that is pre-recorded content that is playing on a certain day at a certain time. So I'm actually gonna jump you right in now to the arts organization's experience on our website, which now includes streaming. One thing that makes us so special is your live theater ticketing, which is this in-person ticketing here for Mary Poppins. That is live theater ticketing, a socially distanced theater, and you're buying tickets for your live theater show directly next to your stream. So in-person and stream ticket, streaming tickets side by side. Some bells and whistles, you can add B-roll footage and commercials to your live streaming. And so this is just a screen showing the ticketing there. But what I wanna quickly just show you is how simple this really is. So, so to set up this event, you just create a new event. I'm gonna edit this event. All you need to do is put in the name of the show, your contact information. You can upload a poster and again, some B-roll footage. You can cast your show and show who is cast, the artists who are part of your show. Some venue information. You can enter all the ticket pricing that you want. And then you set the dates of the stream. It takes less than five minutes to set up your event for ticketing and also for streaming. Once your event is set up, it is literally this simple. You come down here to the date of your show. You click on this menu and you choose live stream credentials. You click on this live stream credentials and it will give you a credential. You can take this credential and use it in the free, it's completely free streaming software called Showstream. Showstream is being offered by one of our partners, Broadway Media Distribution, BMD, Broadway Media Distribution. They are a uh, camera and camera and software people and there they live in that streaming world a lot of you might know them from their projections so you take this credential and you literally just drop it into that software that connects the applications that you're using to stream your show to your ticketed event on our site it's literally that simple I should note that you can use the free shows you can use the free show stream software but also we offer this RTMP information. This RTMP information allows you to stream using whatever application you want to use if you have one that outputs RTMP. Zoom outputs RTMP. StreamYard outputs RTMP. I should say that Broadway Media Distribution also is a partner with StreamYard. So you can go to Broadway Media Distribution and actually get StreamYard through them as well. And they offer tutorials and cameras for that. So you can use other applications as long as it outputs RTMP, which is the de facto standard for live streaming. For uh, video on demand and scheduled content, all you do is literally upload your content. And once you're, you've uploaded the content, it's over. Once people buy tickets, they get, shoot, they 
get a ticket, here's an example of a ticket, all they have to do is point their camera at the QR code and it lets the patron in to view it. Or they can go to a URL and enter an access code. This access code, what's great about it, makes it so that only one patron can view the stream at a time. So every single person who buys a ticket has a unique access code. If they try to distribute that access code to multiple people, it will fail. Only one person can watch the stream with that access code. I'll just quickly show you the uh, player. So the player is here. So here we are at the player. So once a patron enters an access code, they're now watching the stream in 1080p. You can stream all the way up to 1080p, okay? So this is a video on demand that I have playing right here. And I just wanna show you some quick features that we offer inside of the player. Here, the patron can see a description or synopsis of the show that you entered. They can also see the cast list. I actually cast some of you who are here today in the show. Hopefully I cast it okay. So your patrons can see the cast list. And we also partner with Playbill. If some of you use the Play Builder system, your patrons can actually be linked directly to your virtual show Playbill so they can look through the show Playbill while they're watching your stream. They can also donate to your arts organization by clicking the donate. And this is wonderful. There is a chat feature where the patrons can interact with you, the arts organization, and with themselves during the production. So full chat capability built into the live streams right off the bat and you control if that chat is on or off. If you don't want the chat, you can turn it off or you can turn it on. So this is a very fast overview of the platform we've created, but we hope that you see that we've tried to create it simple. It's about the show and celebrating the show and it's fully integrated. The, you do it all within the website and then you can use your favorite streaming application and we highly recommend working with Broadway Media Distribution and their show stream software that's free because it really is comprehensive and your students will love to learn the software. So we also want to make sure that uh, we also want to make sure everyone's invited to our Tuesday. Uh, it's a pre-release where we're going to go even more in depth into the platform and what you can do on it. Um, and that's going to be on our website. So you can just come and visit us on Tuesday. It's at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Awesome. Steele and Jeff, thank you so much. That is really, really exciting. Thank um, you. If you could please share uh, in the chat that uh, the, the link to your website so people can sign up in that time again. I know that there will be people who are interested in doing that. Um, two quick questions before I let you go. Sure. Um, one that came in from the chat, is this available for shows in Australia? And then one that I have that I'm sure everyone else is going to think about is, is this just for MTI shows or can it be for other things? Um, I'll take the first question. We're, we're uh, right now working on getting international rights. Um, again, we're working with MTI and other licensing houses to get the ability to do this in other countries. So keep your fingers crossed, it's gonna be coming as soon as we can make it happen. Obviously, we want it to be available to as many people across the globe as possible. So we're, we're hard at work doing that. And then, um, Steele, do you want to take the second question? Or, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, this platform is, is, is for everyone. It is for you, it is not just for MTI shows. We actually have some really exciting announcements coming in the pipeline, but it, it, anything that you are permitted and have licenses, and are allowed to share, it's for you. Again, classroom projects, cooking classes, choir concerts, classes, band choir concerts, 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 dance events, any of this stuff, everyone. Yep. Exciting. Well, thank you so much. There's uh, more information in, uh, in PDFs that, uh, that Steele shared with me that are in our resources page. And then please feel free to 
um, access that uh, that upcoming uh, teaser and and more deep dive into this software. Thank and we'll you so be much available for joining us. Chat. It will be available in chat if anyone has any additional questions. Thanks, Alan. Thank Great. You Thanks, so Alan. Much. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move right along. Um, so our next guest is Daniel Abramson, who works with Melissa Bensick, uh, as well as a composer and lyricist in his own right and has his own company um, and has been making some of these uh, live virtual musical performances happen on Zoom. So welcome, Daniel, and please teach us what you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll go through some of it in the uh, in the minutes that I have here. So um, yeah, thank you so much for for having me here. Am I coming up there? Let me see. Okay, great. So yeah, I'm a composer lyricist based in Toronto, Ontario. I was so excited that my new musical Super School was being commissioned and presented by Bravo Academy, working with a group of 13 students ranging in age from 14 to 17. And when COVID arrived, we decided without really knowing how, how to move the whole project online. So over 10 four hour rehearsals, we prepared and executed a live broadcast of the show to a paying audience. Uh, we auditioned, rehearsed and performed the whole 70 minute show live. About 30% of it was pre-recorded, uh, entirely online and in isolation. And along the way, learned a whole bunch of things about doing musicals on Zoom uh, and that let us get away with it. So I wanna talk a little bit about the audio end of things with you guys here, because I know we're all craving some kind of rubber hits the road solutions. So as everyone here knows from uh, showing up for birthday parties on Zoom, it is impossible to sing together using the audio backend of Zoom. So for rehearsals, we used a program called Jamulus, which connects multiple students to one audio room, which allows for a near zero delay experience when practicing music. Now I have an example here for you of multi-client audio. Client is uh, an end user, a student recorded using Jamulus, as well as a display of its main fader. Now you're going to listen to some rehearsal footage. This is one of the first beautiful moments when we got to hear uh, the song come together for the first time. But I'm going to slow down. I'm going to make sense. Let's see if it's cool. Let's see if it's cool. I'm going to stand out. Let's see if it's cool. Let's see if it's cool. I'm going to cheer up. I'm going to disappear. So yeah, like multi-singer collaboration is uh, absolutely possible. So what we did is we would have all the students with their scores up on their computer, Jamulus running in the background. They would sight read and sing along into Jamulus. Now about 80% of the students were able to download, install, and run Jamulus using a PDF guide that I made. And I've made it free, uh, available to everybody here. And about 20% took about half an hour of additional tech support time. It's worth noting that Mac laptop laptops had the easiest time connecting. Our older creative team uh, took a little more time to get going. Uh, in this next clip, you're going to see a Zoom video mosaic, but the audio is being created in Jamulus, uh, two singers with live piano, and that's rooted back into Zoom. <laughs> Teams excited there. That was the first successful test. This technology, <laughs> we're all uh, very excited to get working. So, in performance, a musical director needs to carefully plan when to move to different audio sources. So, I like to organize these sources uh, the following way. I call the first one room audio. Now, this is basically just a singer playing a track on a speaker, singing on top of that into their microphone. You've seen a lot of live performance done this way, room audio. The second one we like to call post audio, which is audio mixed into a video track that's uh, created in post-production that kind of takes over. And the third is called overlay audio, uh, which is performed live and overlaid into the Zoom stage. So in our production of Super School, we used all three of these audio sources to create the score for the show. In this next clip, uh, which is a duet, the room audio is being passed off between two different singers. So basically Anton plays his track on his speaker and sings uh, his solo verse and Daniela starts her track to begin her solo creating a pass off. Check it out. So much time blending in, never safe in my own skin. Can anyone see me when I'm nobody at all? Hey, I see you. Look at me. I see you and like what I see. 
it's important for musical directors to try to put these little pass off points on the bar lines to create that seamless musical feel. Uh, while we found Jamulus to be a great rehearsal tool, we weren't able to quite get it stable enough to be relied on for our live performance online. So creating music videos in post production was a really fun and creative way to get multiple singers together. In this clip, I'm going to show you the splice in point where we transition from the overlay audio into the post audio. Hey guys. I've got a good feeling about all this. Here we go. Day one. Sophomore year will finally be fun. We can Pretty quick, huh? And uh, here's another clip transitioning from room audio into post audio into our big finale video. <laughs> It's worth pointing out that the students had an incredibly fun time uh, making all of these videos for our production. Now for this next one, uh, if it's okay with you guys, I just want to do a quick costume change. There, that's better. Now for this final vocal, it was entirely in post, but then we transitioned back into the live Zoom stage so we could bring in all the families that helped support our production. Let's rebuild this super school and make it even better somehow. love watching that one. Uh, so as you guys can see, developing, rehearsing, and presenting a musical online in isolation is not only possible, but it's really fulfilling and a really educational experience for both the cast and the creative team. Well, all these solutions we've seen tonight, they're never perfect for me. They're infinitely better than not doing a musical at all. So I started a new company called Stream Stage, which is me and my fiance. We're two artists with over a decade in experience in musical direction, direction, choreography, and performing. And we're now uh, offering a range of consulting and producing services to help you imagine, prepare for, and execute a successful musical in digital isolation. While you're thinking about shows to pick, there's a lot of great options tonight. Uh, consider checking out Super School. It's a show all about ability and accepting others for who they are. I hope what I showed you tonight fills you with some curiosity and some hope, and please reach out and uh, let's make all these musicals happen successfully online. Awesome. Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, I know that there's uh, uh, some really exciting things that you're doing, and uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, PDFs that you shared with us, both about your uh, your consulting firm and also about Jamulus. Um, there are many other things and the chat is blowing up with excitement. So um, <laughs> definitely, you definitely have some converts there. Um, people want your email as well, it looks like. So you have some fans. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, we'll see if we have any time left at the end for questions, but right now I'm gonna continue moving on. Thanks so much for joining us, that was really cool. Um, okay, so uh, now we have Jeff Lazarus, who is the CEO of Real Time Music Solutions, um, a company who makes Symphonia, uh, RMS Coach, RMS Mix, and other uh, rehearsal and performance uh, uh, apps and uh, and solutions for for both live and uh, and rehearsal environments. And he's going to talk about Rehearsal Live Share, which is their newly launched uh, service to help us rehearse in isolation. So, hi Jeff, nice hi, to see you. Alan, uh, thanks for having me here. I'm really glad to be talking to all of you. Um, you stole my first few lines um, <laughs> by way of background. We have been doing this for about uh, 20 years, and we have a number of products that are all about helping you rehearse and produce, uh, re rehearse and perform your musical. Um, now, when the lockdown hit, when the pandemic hit, we knew we were in trouble. Um, all of our market is live performance and education. So when that shut down, that shut down everything for us. So we knew Mother of Invention needed to come to our, our, uh, our help here. And we decided on day one of the lockdown that we were gonna do something specifically aimed for this new world. Now, at that same time, Zoom was exploding. And our first thought was, well, Zoom, had, Zoom has a very robust um, application development platform. We'll just We'll just piggyback on Zoom. We'll extend, we'll extend uh, some little piece of software that plugs into Zoom and allows us to do some rehearsals remotely. 
Now, as I'm sure many of you have already come to realize, that's, it's, it's not going to work. It's not possible. Zoom is designed for business. It's designed for one person talks, the next person talks in succession. And I even have little algorithms that actually prevent any kind of simultaneous sound. Like, uh, like if you type on your keyboard, that will get uh, filtered out or any other thing. So the, the concept of two people performing together is it just runs against the grain of what Zoom does. So the next thing we thought we'd do is we would create our own thing from the ground up. Technologically, Zoom isn't that difficult of a concept, and we thought we could do something that was more geared towards music. However, we found that was also a problem uh, for the same reasons, I guess, that Zoom doesn't do it. There's a, a known concept called buffer bloat. And in essence, what that means is everybody on the internet, when you're, when you're in conversation with uh, someone else on the other side, everyone has a different route. Their data comes through a different service provider, a different uh, relay bit of equipment, different buffering schemes. And that means that one person will hear something a quarter second late, another person will hear something a half second late, and it just is impossible to synchronize. So we were pretty bummed out after you know, a month or so of really giving that the good old college try and we just, we, we, we had to chuck it in the garbage. But then we had an epiphany. We realized we have a ton of experience by our other products of dealing with metric time, coding it and manipulating it so it could be used in a live performance context. So once we let go of a certain concept, the concept of everybody actually hearing each other as if they're in the same room, we could still provide something value added. And the way it works is this. Everyone is involved in the rehearsal. Say you have a 15 member chorus, the music director, there's one person who's the music director, everybody else is a participant. When the music director hits play, that triggers the music happening on everybody else's computer instantaneously in real time. At that particular moment, everybody is in sync. Now when they sing along with it, that's where the sync drifts. However, when the data then travels back to the music director, we can correlate that. We can take all the data bits and pieces, line it up with the precise measure, beat, and tick. So at measure 10, beat two, this is where the particular audio file is supposed to land. Then the music director hears everything together in sync and he can give notes in real time because the notes don't have to sync with the rest of the, the music. You can say, hey, Jill, you're getting a little flat, or Tom, don't speed up here. And that can happen in real time as the rehearsal performance is happening. Then that's also captured and can be, um, it's recorded and immediately played back to all the participants. So in a subsequent iteration, instead of playing to just a backing track, you could be playing to your full choral arrangements minus your part. And all of this can be mixed independently uh, by either you or the music director. So I wanted to just quickly, I, what I could do since I do have a little, everybody's doing a bit of show and tell, so I'll do the same thing and I'll show it in its most basic iteration. Share screen. Pardon me. Okay, here we go. Uh, so what are you feeling today? Uh, oh, what a beautiful morning. Uh, so poor Judd's dead. Let's do my favorite song in this show, which is Poor Judd is Dead. All right, that's a, that's a happy little tune for everybody. Jeff, we can hear but not okay. see it. We can't uh, so see So I'm going to oh, be... Now? I'm the director here, oh. so any. Okay, my Zoom skills, I guess, are not up to stuff. Well, is this does this bring it to the front? Can you see? Now we see email. There we. You see it there now. There we go. Yes. That I do on this side will happen on David's side. I changed to poor Judd and it changed to poor Judd on his side. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit play and it's going to play on his side. But his voice, 
uh, is going to come over to my side and I'm going to hear it all in time with the music. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute uh, Curly's part here uh, so that we don't have a MIDI piano playing along with uh, David's beautiful singing voice. And I think that's it. You ready, David? I'm ready. Excellent. Here we go. Up a bit more, uh, kind of. Oh, gather round his coffin Excellent. now and cry. He had a heart of gold, and he wasn't very old. Oh, why did such a fella have to die? Beautiful. Excellent. And as you saw there, <laughs> thank you. Uh, as you saw there, I was able to uh, listen to his performance and watch him and give him a note in the middle, and he was able to course correct. Uh, this is just one of the features of Rehearsal Live Share. Thanks for watching. Okay, so that's it in its basic form, and this is available right now. Um, we wanted to get something out as quickly as possible. We started at the lockdown. This by right should be a really a multi-year project and we got something together in about two and a half months. Um, we will continue to iterate. We're gonna be releasing, the beta's out now, the next version will probably be out next week and that's gonna be our first multi-peer version where we, you can have uh, bandwidth dependent, you can have 15 or so people rehearsing together. And then from there, we're adding all sorts of additional bells and whistles, like the ability to share individual uh, vocal tracks and, uh, and uh, stream it later if you want. So it's hard to okay, get it all. So I've been thinking minutes. about making this video for a while. Oh. And it's about Sting. Sorry about that. All right, um, and uh, could you tell us just a little bit about where it's going to where it's going to go? Uh, right now, I, I, as I understand it, it's a it's a one person coaching situation, but it potentially could uh, will have a group rehearsal as a possibility. Right now, it's available with our RMS RMS Coach platform, which is our rehearsal software, um, and that is uh, in, in in terms of what you can download this very second is a one-on-one -on -one concept, a music director and student or vocal teacher and vocal recitalist. We believe next week we're gonna introduce the multi-peer version, which could be anything you want. After it's done with RMS, RMS Coach, we're going to integrate it into our other products, starting with RMS Mix, which means it could be any audio track that you want. Um, Coach is the MIDI side, Mix is the standard audio side. Uh, same principle, the audio file that you start with is going to be embedded with the metric information that allows all the dis disparate parts to be aligned and heard in without latency and cleanly as a single ensemble performance by the music director and then shared sub subsequently after that. Great. And uh, the, the idea behind that is that uh, we can eventually have, uh, people can use their own content as well as licensed content, is that right? Absolutely. We've been getting a lot of calls and uh, emails, especially from um, choralists, choirs. Uh, you know, the, the musical theater is our main background, so that's where we're focused first. But it could be anything. Whatever, whatever content you can create can be put into this platform. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, please stick around. We'll see if there's, uh, if there's additional questions, if we have time for it. I uh, want to keep moving. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thanks so um, much, everybody. Great. Um, so next up is uh, Tim Espinoza from Fullerton College, who's going to talk a little bit about acting performance classes, as well as lecture-based classes and some solutions for the fall semester. Hi, everyone. Hey, How are you? Good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh, my name is Tim Espinosa. I serve as the chair of theater arts and the head of musical theater at Fullerton College. And uh, I also serve as the distance education representative for our division. So we cover both theater arts, music, and uh, art in general. And in the midst of this massive wave of transition that we had to all go through, where we, our lives seem to be uprooted and transitioned to an online learning format, one of the biggest conversations that we were having is how do we address um, inequities that exist within uh, the online learning format? I teach at a two-year college, so many of the students that I work with, 
uh, come from many different backgrounds and they have many different kinds of socioeconomic challenges that they are experiencing. And a lot of them, <clears throat> excuse me, um, don't have access to the necessary tools to be successful. So, um, you know, when, when uh, we first transitioned to online learning, Zoom was a very, um, was the go-to thing. But I didn't feel like Zoom was necessarily addressing the um, inequities in terms of access to synchronous or asynchronous learning. So I was searching for a new application where students could asynchronously submit their, uh, their final performances or their product and get real-time or time-coded feedback. And the application that I found that was a game changer for not only myself, but my colleagues was this application called Go React. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about Go React and what it can do uh, for, uh, for addressing not only just the uh, equity challenges that we face, but also creating a platform outside of Zoom where you can actually instruct within an application. So what is GoReact and what is, what is its primary purpose? Um, it is a means for instructors to provide a more equitable online learning environment by allowing students to upload performance-based videos at their own pace. So I use this in my MT performance-based classes. Uh, we've had um, instructors use them in dance-based classes and in music theory classes as well. Uh, it also offers an alternate to Zoom with more capabilities for faculty to student feedback. Uh, GoReact also allows the instructor and students to provide time-coded feedback, which I'll give a small little demonstration at the very end of this uh, as to what time-coded feedback references on any of the videos that they may submit, uh, submit and allows for a combination of both synchronous and asynchronous learning, which I think really is key. I think not just of assuming that all students have the equitable means to be synchronous in their learning environment. So we need to make sure that there is a balance. So why should we look at GoReact as a viable option? And I'm not, I'm not downplaying Zoom in the least bit. I think Zoom serves a massive, uh, a massive uh, set of importance in, in the learning. But I think there, with this uh, additive tool, you can really maximize the student's learning experience. So why GoReact? Um, to enable students the ability to asynchronously upload class performances via self-tape for assessment, not only by the instructor, but the, by their peers as well. Uh, students can also upload a YouTube video or a Vimeo link or directly upload to the video to GoReact. Uh, the, instru the instructor can also use GoReact as an alternate to Zoom when it comes to online coaching sessions. You can actually have real-time coaching sessions if that's something you do uh, that's outside of Zoom. Um, and also fellow classmates can observe those coaching sessions uh, and put themselves in the background. The instructor can also use GoReact for web conferences or scene study with the multiple camera option. So there's an option where you can actually have two students side by side stacked, so very similar to uh, Zoom, and the rest of the students can be in the background and you can actually facilitate a coaching session in an acting class when they're doing musical theater scene study or if they're doing an acting scene study class. Uh, it also allows the instructor and fellow classmates to provide time-coded feedback, which I'll address in just a moment, through various formats, either synchronously and asynchronously. Uh, there's also, what's really great is there's seamless integration with uh, most of your school's online learning platforms, such as Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, or Brightspace. Many of you not, may not know it, but uh, depending on what your online learning platform is, we use Canvas at our institution. Uh, you may already have, uh, a, uh, your institution may already have a relationship with GoReact that you can access as a third party application that can be embedded into your online learning platform. Um, also, it allows for seamless uh, integration of grading criteria and rubrics. So maybe if you are already an online instructor and you had set up rubrics and you have a grading scheme already calculated within your online learning platform, uh, GoReact actually, uh, figures out uh, what your criteria is, your grading criteria and your rubric and integrates it automatically from your online learning platform directly into the application. Uh, also, it's an excellent uh, collecting, it's excellent for collecting evidence uh, if your school is requiring you to go through some kind of accreditation process through this online learning platform because it records and databases and documents all the videos that students submit. You can access them. I can access videos now from this past semester even though the course is closed. So uh, it's a means by which to submit evidence that the class was taking place online, if that's something that your institutions are requiring for you. Um, and it's also a fantastic assessment for monologues, vocal performances, dance lessons. And what's really exciting is if you are in an environment where you are um, 
at the end of the semester doing group uh, faculty assessments for either dance, acting, uh, voice, or music, you can actually use this application and invite fellow instructors into Go React to observe other students' self tapes. So if that's part of your process for accreditation or the students, the, uh, part of the process that students have to go through, you're still able to, uh, to meet those demands at the end of uh, the term. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you just a small little brief description and show you kind of um, uh, what it looks like when you transition. So I'm going to shift over to a screen share option and then I'll show you one of my assignments within my Canvas shell. So what I for this assignment, I had uh, my uh, advanced musical theater students. They had to submit uh, this past semester a contemporary pop rock self tape upload. And uh, so this is the assignment within Canvas. And I put all the criteria. And then once I had embedded Go React into Canvas, so they were talking to each other, this little uh, box pops up on the very bottom. And when you click on it, it takes you to the assignment within Go React. So now I'm actually in the Go React app. And since this is a historical record of classes, obviously the classes, the uh, assignments are graded. But you can see Go React has now populated all of our students self tapes for that particular assignment. So I can now go in as the instructor and start grading them and providing feedback asynchronously to the students, not only just the instructor, but all of the, their peers. So for example, if one of my students submits, every other student can go in and actually provide time coded feedback on their work. So I think uh, I think we all agree that not only just the instructor providing feedback, but having peer feedback is very much an integral part of the learning experience. So I'm going to click on one of my former students' videos. Uh, can everyone see okay, Alan? Are we able to see okay? Okay, great. Um, let me, I'll pull up Chloe. Okay, so what happens is on the left side of the screen, Chloe's self-tape pops up. And as I press play, I ha now have the ability Think of it like a chat box. I have the ability to actually write real-time time-coded feedback as the video is playing. And as the video is playing, the, the video will pause once I start typing. It's intuitive that way. So you have the ability to either type in a text comment, a video comment. You can do an audio comment. You can upload a file. You can upload a YouTube link. Maybe they want you want them to reference something. You can also upload from your own library if you have things saved already on Go React, and then you could even put it a very a little end note at the very end of uh, their video. So, for example, if I press play, and my students have approved this, so uh, yeah, they have my consent. They have uh, they gave me consent. So I'm pressing play, and I'm looking at Chloe, and I want to pause because I say excellent focus. So it paused, and now I'm able to type. And as soon as I press return it's going to continue playing. Nice placement. And you get the idea. I can keep typing as I'm, uh, as I'm uh, observing her feedback. Now, what happens is once I actually provide the feedback, it gets popped up into this comment box in time. So Chloe can now go back in and press that right there, and it'll take her back to the actual moment where that feedback occurred. And if you notice, just like subtitles on the very bottom, it actually uh, puts captioned here, uh, captions the actual comment here. And so you can do that. And it's been, my students have been exceptionally responsive to this. They have really enjoyed it. And they can, they can go back, they were able to go back at any point in the semester and review their own self tapes. And it was really transformative. And when I did a survey at the end of the semester, they all agreed that they preferred the Go React option than doing all of, than observing self tapes on Zoom, uh, primarily because they had the freedom to asynchronously observe each other's work without having to be confined to a two hour class where they had to uh, feel the pressure to you know write provide feedback. They could do it at their own pace. Uh, so I thought you know, for me this was been this has been a really pivotal experience uh, using Go React, and I continue to use it, and I will continue to use it in the future moving forward as we as we prepare for uh, remote learning in the fall semester. So that's a little bit about Go React, Alan. Tim, thank you so much. This is a platform that I've been looking at a lot. I really like the um, the uh, the ability to time code our feedback to say this is exactly where 
we're having, where, where this note is given. Um, one of the things I, I, that I found as I was looking on their, on their website and evaluating various platforms about video sharing is that it, the original use cases were for sign language interpreters mm -hmm. and also for student teacher observations that when someone might need to walk watch um, a teaching demonstration maybe not be there but then give very specific notes it seems like oh my gosh if i could use this for my rehearsals and give very specific time but a note i wouldn't have to say you know timmy you remember this time in the show when you were doing you know, all of that stuff so it looks really interesting and i like the the whole thing about asynchronous being able to not be zoom fatigued so thank you for sharing that we really appreciate it absolutely my pleasure all right, great. So I have um, a, a whole um, list of a lot of random stuff. Um, and unlike, uh, I, I guess, some of, some of the earlier um, things about this webinar that were focused on new features, um, this is a highly opinionated um, from experience and research uh, looking at the tools that we're all trying to look at as educators right now of saying, you know, our, our universities are coming to us and says, what equipment do you need? Well, I don't know. So I've had to look it up. Um, so I'm going to share with you a document that, it, that I put together this afternoon that it hopefully will guide us through some of this conversation. Um, and it, is, of course, is available on our resources. Um, so I am screen sharing. Can everyone see that okay? I'm hoping. Um, so all of a sudden your pictures went away. Um, but anyway, so this is, uh, again, my own opinions and from my own experience. So please take that, this with as much salt as you want. Um, so a lot of us have been talking about high flex. Uh, class delivery uh, for anyone who's reading uh, higher ed, uh, inside higher ed, you know, talking about the ability to have what if our students are there and what if our students are not there versus uh, low density or um, someone's sick and they have to quarantine. How are we going to do that? Or do we want to teach our classes twice? I think the answer, of course, is no. So how do we figure that out? So one of the things that I've been looking at is the various camera options for music, theater, and dance classes, as well as streaming um, options. And so this is some of the representative stuff from low to high that I've found. Um, so the Mevo Start is a brand new camera. Mevo um, is owned by Livestream and who then it was bought up by Vimeo. Um, and they have a, a camera that's popular that I've seen before. Um, that, but this was this one's a new camera, and from the YouTube videos that I've watched, it seems to be good. Um, there's three microphones on top, six-hour battery life. Um, there's the ability to uh, have multiple cameras live stream to multiple platforms at the same time, and you don't have to plug it into anything. So that's what's kind of cool. I, I, um, yeah, and yes, Lauren, uh, this document is in the chat. Is, is sorry, is not in the chat. Is in uh, on the website and our course in our resources for this webinar. Um, so you'll have access to all these links. Um, so there's three digital mics on board, and then uh, and it processes it spatially, and it also will in a in a somewhat um, easy way can track the presenter moving around the screen. Um, and you use the Meepo app to do that. Um, we've ordered these, but I've not gotten them in yet, so I haven't gotten to test this. Um, but it seems like a good uh, option for classroom live streaming, especially um, if we're at low density. So we've, we at Ohio University, we've ordered these for our school of theater faculty, and we'll see what happens. Um, and it's $3.99, and that was just released. Um, so that's kind of like the, in terms of like not using your phone, but actually having a camera that is just, I'm live streaming my class today. That to me seems like the most cost-effective resource that I found. Uh, Swivel seems to be really useful. I know I saw some things in the chat about dance classes and uh, a lot of our colleagues are talking about this platform. So what this is, this is an illustration from their website that they just updated, but basically it's this turning and tilting iPad robot carrier. So you can, uh, again, you can look this up more on the website, but what's interesting about it is, so it live streams with, with an iPad. So you have to have an iPad separately and the starter kit with a couple of these markers, which we'll talk about is that price point. So it can be kind of pricey. Um, but what happens is, is basically the uh, instructor or the people who are doing the scene. So you can get multiple markers with these little like sort of, key fobs with a microphone in it and what it does is it tracks where you are in the room and so the robot turns the ipad and tilts it to focus on people and what's nice about it is is like if you have a couple of these markers set up in the room you could have 
good audio for the presenter. You have good audio for the classmates. If you're doing a scene, you could have good audio for both of those people. Um, and so it does support multiple cameras, multiple audio channels, screencasting, and timestamped comments according to their website. And there's accounts and all kinds of stuff like that. But that is sort of like what seems to be potentially the most useful for dance is what we found um, and what some of my colleagues are talking about. Then of course, like the gold standard, what they have in uh, universities where there's permanent lectures uh, set up is a PTZ camera, which stands for pan, tilt, and zoom. And uh, they're, they are, uh, there's all kinds of different versions, but usually those are permanently mounted and usually they start at about that price point is from what I've seen. And here's some links that talks about using PTZ for theater. If so if you're thinking about, oh, we're gonna live stream all of our shows, we should install cameras. This was a discussion about that um, and some various brands. Um, this is pretty pricey. And obviously this isn't going into the whole way that you look at um, switching live video to do that stream uh, in your streaming software and all of that. So. Um, a video switcher, video production, it might be a whole nother thing, but just in terms of cameras, this is sort of the three basic classes that I found. Okay, um, so continuing, um, so software options. Um, the most popular on YouTube uh, seems to be OBS, which is open source and free. Open broadcaster software, and often that can uh, can uh, use that RTMP that uh, Steele Wallace was talking about earlier, that open protocol that everybody seems to use for live streaming. So that is a really great software program to download and it's free and connects to most webcams and things. So if you wanted to do a Facebook Live or a YouTube Live, you could get started on that now. It's a pretty easy download and like I said, it's free. Um, one thing uh, as an alternative to some of the things that were talked about today, Twitch is potentially interesting and I've seen um, very, very little, but some conversation about using Twitch, which is traditionally for gaming. So people will, you wouldn't believe, but apparently on the internet, people play video games and they wear a headset and they talk and they live stream this and people think this is interesting. I don't, but you know, that's not my generation. Um, and uh, yet there, because it is designed for gaming, the high resolution video and the relatively low latency of the ability to live stream and play each other in real time. Twitch has figured out a lot of stuff that I think that some of these platforms are not really thinking about in terms of video and audio quality. So that might be worth it. And today looking on their website, they have a creator camp. Um, and I see in the chat, yes, this document is in the resource list in its entirety. Um, StreamYard is, uh, works with Broadway on um, Broadway uh, Digital Media, I believe it was called, um, that uh, is working with Show Ticks for You um, and is a, is a software in their own right where you can have accounts. Uh, they do have some free options as well as accounts and that, that is a seemingly popular streaming site to places like Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn and other platforms. Um, so you can check them out. Um, one that our university uses that I uh, personally have had some really good experience with is Panopto. Um, so this is a, uh, a, a marketed for lecture capture. I believe they also have some live streaming options. Um, and it's also a great internal way to accept video assignments, sort of like Go React. Um, I, I think Go React seems to have, uh, be a little bit more, um, a little bit higher quality in terms of the the timestamped features, although you can do timestamped comments. Um, uh, this is something that I use a lot personally for filming my lectures uh, or mini lecture videos. Um, and what's really nice about it is that it captures the viewer analytics. So I can give students points for watching the video and, and check if they did it in its entirety. It's accessible. So there's automatic captioning here um, and they're hosted by my university. So it's secure, which I find a really um, helpful thing as opposed to um, everybody putting their videos on YouTube unlisted and then sharing it with all their friends. Um, I think that that potentially we, we need solutions where things are a little bit more controlled than that. Um, a couple other options for streaming, Microsoft Stream for those universities who are Microsoft 365, formerly known as Office 365 users. They have um, a, a, a sort of internal YouTube um, that can be protected. So that is a, another way to go that's not YouTube. Uh, right now, the thing is, is you can't see the viewer analytics, so I can't give points to students who watch it. This is an upvoted comment. And if you go on Microsoft's thing, you can upvote my suggestion to say, hey, we need to track that. But apparently that's gonna come at some point. Um, and yes, you're welcome, Mrs. Curry for the dance shout out. Um, and Top Hat, um, 
they just announced uh, a, uh, right now they're a student engagement thing. Um, so primarily has been previously for live um, classroom interactions like formerly clickers as well as some in-person testing but they're they just are rolling out a whole new uh, distance learning and uh, and remote learning platform that um, they're having a webinar next week that I'm attending so check them out um, okay so a couple things that we seem to do a lot of in performance YouTube sharing, right? So people send out private or unlisted uh, options. I'm not really loving the whole YouTube thing. There's a lot of links flying around and it's not secure and it doesn't seem to be focused on the work um, or, or in, in a way where people can easily comment and give student feedback. So like Tim was saying, there, here's a couple other options that I found. Um, I'm using Flipgrid right now, which is owned by Microsoft and they're primarily actually uh, geared towards K-12. And so it, it sort of feels like that when you watch it, but it, it's really actually kind of interesting. Um, so it's free now, it used to be paid. Um, and the mission is empower every voice. And so you have these grids for your classes and you can create an assignment and for performance or discussion and students post their video responses. So everybody posts a video and you can also make it really Snapchatty and fun and have emojis and things like that and, you know, put stickers on your face. And then uh, the students and faculty both can reply with video responses. So I like this. I'm using it in classes where I can give private written video or and or rubric scoring feedback. And then I can also give vibes to my students and highlight uh, exceptional work um, and have a showcase there. Um, a couple other ones my university uses is VoiceThread, which does do time-stamped collaborative uh, annotations uh, on, so you can load in a PowerPoint, you can load in videos, um, and it's multimedia. Um, I personally have had some issues with buffering issues on this platform. Um, I know that they just released a new iOS update. Um, so, uh, and oh, so someone's asking, uh, my, uh, my document is named my last name, Kenny, and then tech resources. So you can find it under K. I saw it on the website. So that's there. And yes, uh, Flipgrid is for, for fifth graders is super cute, but also it can be used for higher ed too. Um, and then, like I said, Panopto, you can also have a repository for student videos and you can have written feedback on timestamps. My issue that I found is that I don't get a notification when the student leaves a comment on the video. So that's why I'm not using it for that purpose because I don't know when they comment and I'm not gonna go back and look. Um, and then Go React, which Tim shared with us and talked about. Um, I was asked, uh, I know we're in the waning minutes of this. Um, I have done some presentations at previous uh, Music Theater Educators Alliance conferences about music theory and oral skills solutions. And so here's a few um, on this list and you can watch, uh, there's, archive if you're a member uh, you can see my uh, my my longer presentations about these various solutions uh, but there are some free solutions uh, for people who have to deliver music theory and oral skills uh, musictheory.net teoria um, there's a lot of quizzes here some free stuff some paid stuff which is uh, risingsoftware.com i found really robust smart music which i'm just sort of getting into um, hook theory which is my favorite thing on the internet um, which is amazing. So they have this thing called relative notation and Roman numeral analysis. Um, uh, yes, yeah, someone said Flipgrid is dummy proof for the kids. It totally is and it's secure and I like it. Um, and they have 13,000 songs, which will just like shake it off from Taylor Swift that shows you the Roman numeral analysis and plays it back for you with the music video. Um, so I find that pretty cool. And then there's some other resources as well on here. Um, and feel free to send me an email if you want to chat further about any of this stuff. I'm a bit of a tech geek at Ohio University and I really like to look for some of these new things. So I guess that's where we are. Stacy, I see you. Do you want to take us out? Sure. Thank you so much, Alan. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us tonight and for our esteemed panelists and guests. And I'd like to personally thank Molly Garner, our um, ad MTA administrator, who is not um, a, a, a tech guru, but has worked very, very hard um, in making this run as smoothly as possible. We also had um, Julie, our stage manager, who um, sort of came on at the last minute. Um, I'd like to thank Joe Deere, who this was sort of his brainchild. He contacted me um, 
and said, we need to, to do this. And I said, yes, that is, I completely agree. And so, and then last but not least, I'd like to thank the executive board of MTA, who without them, this would not have been possible. Um, we've all worked really hard and put in a lot of time to bring this to you. So although it was not perfect, um, we wanted to bring you as much information as possible and we hope that you got at least a little bit of um, information and um, resources. And again, we're happy to share those with you. If you have any questions, if there's someone that you'd like to contact that that is not made available, please contact me or one of the panelists, or, or again, if you're interested in serving on our um, diversity committee, Tim has graciously put his email up there. Um, and most of our emails in various categories um, can be found on our website. So um, I freaking love this organization. They've done so much for me. I've been a member for, um, I, ooh, almost 15 years now maybe and um, I can't stress to you how what a wonderful group of people this is so if you're interested in joining we'd love for you to and um, yeah everybody have a great night